You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you are notified for when my next podcast goes live. Big Moran and today's guest we've got George Bambi back. Georgie boy, how are you? I'm all right, James. How are you doing? You all right? Thanks Good, for having mate. me on. Yeah, thanks for coming on again. Charlie Bronson's son, you were on last year. Charlie phoned, um, gave a little 15 minute squeal about his life. Um, mad story. Like you've got a DNA test in prison, confirmed it's your son. He's up for parole now. But first and foremost, how are you? Yeah, I'm all right. Been a bit of a tricky time the last few weeks. We just um, just did a big documentary on Channel Four, two parter, um, something that me and Charlie have been working on together for three years or so. Um, I've come on the show to sort of tell you a few home truths and a few facts because this documentary that we just did, me and Charlie ended up having a big fallout at the end of it. Because basically what it was, um, well, I'll tell you what, I'll go to the beginning, shall I? Shall I start the story at the yes. beginning? Right. So basically, for the last couple of weeks, I've had so many idiots online um, saying all sorts of shite and all sorts of crap. You know, they don't know what they're talking about, the majority of them. I've had many, many thousands of people sending me really positive messages and stuff about Charlie. But... What people don't realise is some of the things that they say online, they're saying where they're completely ill-educated about what's been going on. So I thought the time's come for me to reveal who I actually am and what I actually do. Um, you know, there's loads of podcasters out there, you know, well, I say podcasters, I mean, you're a podcaster. I mean, there's people out there with mobile phones with like 400 like subscribers that think the big top podcasters that <clears throat> just talking shy all the time about mine and Charlie's relationship. So I'm going to put it to bed. Basically, many years ago, six years ago, I did a documentary on TV on Channel 4. I had my own TV series. Um, I also had loads of businesses, retired, self-sufficient, all the rest of it. So... During the course of my life, I've been working as a paparazzi and I've been working as an investigative journalist and, and, you know, on quite a few occasions with a lot of the papers as an undercover reporter. So, as a result of my TV show on Channel 4, which was Confessions of the Paparazzi, Paula Williamson got in touch with me and I got a message on Twitter or whatever it was, just said, uh, hi, George, I'm Charlie Bronson's fiance, Paula. So I was like, oh, hello, you all right? And uh, she said, Charles Bronson wants you to come and visit him. So I said, all oh, right, okay. I was like, Charles Bronson, the prisoner, I'd be interested. <clears throat> why, does he want, why does he want me to see him? And she said, he's seen you on the telly. So uh, on your paparazzi programme, you, you know, blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> I said, right, all right, I'll go and see him. Started all the situation rolling. I went down to Stoke to meet Paula. Absolutely lovely woman. Got on really well with her. Um, I got the impression straight away all she was interested in was fame and all the rest of it. But, I mean, that's, you know, that's her thing. She was a lovely person, got on really well with her. Um, so then we went through all the paperwork and um, I was waiting to get approved to go to the prison to visit Charlie. Now, obviously, I'm a reporter. I'm, I work for the press. That's what I've done all my life. I've also got lots of other businesses. So when I got involved with the paperwork to fill in with the home office to go and visit him. The police had to come around to the house to visit me, see who I was, make sure I wasn't going to try and spring him out of prison or whatever. So I told them um, that I had loads of furniture shops and that's what I did for a living. And I was interested in Charles Bronson and seeing him on the telly, blah, 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 and all this. Um, so the police went off, filled all the reports in. <clears throat> Meanwhile, Charlie started sending me loads of letters George Bambi, king of the paparazzi and all this and whatever. Looking forward to seeing you and everything. So I went down to Wakefield Prison for the first visit. And I went with Paula. 
So we're in the car and I'm shitting myself. I'm like, fucking hell, I'm going to see Charles Bronson, who I'd seen in the media and everything portrayed as some nutcase, some violent lunatic. That's how he was portrayed. I'd never met him before. So cut a long story short, went to Wakefield Prison, went through all the security, went through all the dogs sniffing you and all the scanning machines and all the rest of it. Got in to see Charlie. People know the story of how I met Charlie from, from before, you know, standing upside down doing press-ups and all this when I walked in. So we've got in, so we sat there, and he's just looked at me like that. And he's gone. Me and you can do some work together. And I said, what do you mean? And he went, I want to work with you. I want me and you to work together. So I said, what, what do you mean? What, what, what do you want me to do? And he went, you're the best fucking PR man in the country. I've seen you on the telly. You get on great with all the newspapers. You get stuff done. You get loads of stuff in the media. And um, and that's it. I want you to work with me. I want, you know, I want us to do stuff together. You know, I want to make money. I want to make a few quid. I mean, I can't talk about the money side of it with Charlie because obviously being a criminal, he's not allowed to make any money. He's not allowed to profit. So I'll go into that a little bit later on. So anyway, so we're having, this, uh, we're having this meeting for a couple of hours. Had a right laugh, eating ice creams, drinking coffee, having a laugh, all the rest of it. And, um, and he said he wanted me, to, wanted me to be his PR agent. So I said, right, okay. Um, so what's in it for me? What, you know, how are we going to do it? And he just said, I want you to get me loads of publicity. I want you to tell everyone out in the world what's been going on with my life, what's been happening. You know, all the brutality I've been through, expose the system for me and all the rest of it. So I said, yeah, all right, I'm interested. So went off, had a little think about it. We're in the car on the way home and Paul was like, right, well, you can be my manager, but Bambi, get me on um, Loose Women and this, that and the other and whatever. <clears throat> Paul is a lovely one. I'm not going to say slagging her off. She's absolutely lovely. She's fantastic. She's a really good laugh. But she just craved the publicity. And that's essentially what Paula wanted. And, you know, I'm not saying she didn't love Charlie or he didn't love her or whatever, but, you know, everybody says that Paula got together with Charlie for the publicity side of it. I mean, that's down to her. I was just working as a PR agent, and that's what I do as a media specialist. So I went home, had a little think about it, went to visit Charlie again, went, went to visit him, and I said, right, if we're going to do it, we're going to do it 50-50, straight down the middle. I take my 50% of everything we make. The other 50% goes into a pot. We'll set a company up with, with, with a friend of yours or whatever we're going to do. I'm not paying any money to you. I will pay it to whoever you nominate, whichever company or whatever, to, to receive the money because I'm not allowed to pay you anything. So I'm not going to go into that. So I spoke to Charlie further and... We basically decided between us, we were going to literally just take the piss out of the prison service and out of the world's media and going to get him in all the papers, make up loads of stories and just fucking generally just have a laugh, keep oh. him entertained while he was in prison. So basically, I went to see him again. We had another visit. We ironed out what we were going to do. He said he wanted this publicity, he wanted that publicity, he wanted the rest of it, he wanted this exposing, he wanted that exposing, all the rest of it. So we went on the second visit, and after the second visit, I got banned. I got banned from going to the prison. And I was like, why am I banned? So the prison service basically said, you're a reporter, you're a journalist, you're a licensed journalist, member of the NUJ and the BUJ and all that, and uh, you're a journalist. We don't allow journalists into the maximum security facility. We don't allow journalists to speak to Cat A prisoners. You're not allowed to see him anymore, and that's it. So I spoke to Charlie. He used to ring me up every night. And I said to him, uh, I said, I'm banned. Can't see you anymore. Can't come and visit you. That's it. Can't do anything. So he said, well, you're not just going to fucking take that lying down, are you? We're going to have to come up with a plan. So I said, right, okay, then. So Charlie's a very, very clever guy. Very clever guy. 
And as far as the media goes, I'm a very clever guy as well. And people will be watching this thinking, oh, he's fucking on that show to try and self-publicise himself and promote himself. I've got a film on Amazon Prime called Stepdad that was made about my life that I wrote and produced. It's been at the cinemas and the telly and everything. It's on Amazon Prime. I've got two books out. I've got 12 businesses. I own three museums. I own art galleries. I've got loads of escape rooms. I've got 40-odd full-time staff that work for me. I didn't need anything from Charles Bronson financially at all. So I said to him, well, for me to get in and to help you learn about all the treatment that's been going on and working towards helping you change and, and get your parole sorted out and all the rest of it, I need to be involved. And I've come up with a plan. And he said, what's the plan? And I said, well, I was born in 1971, never had any parents, brought up in a children's home, never met my dad. You went into prison in 1974, so how do you feel about having a little uh, son that you didn't know about before you went into prison? And he looked at me and he went, fucking hell, fucking genius. So I said, right, we need to lay some ground rules down, right? If we're going to do this, we need to do it, and only me and you need to know about it, nobody else. So I think I know what you're going to say here, that. Like Right. Are you Charlie Brunson's son? No, I'm not Charles Brunson's son. There's more chance of me being the fucking Pope's son. <laughs> I'm a paparazzi photographer, I'm a journalist, and I do a lot of undercover work, PR work with the media, right? So you've got all these brain boxes online that have just literally for years have been going, he's a fraud, he's a con man, he's conning Charlie, he's fucking full of shit, he's going on about this DNA test and all the rest of it. Everything that came up about me being Charlie's son was what me and Charlie did together as a team, both of us, as a team, as a laugh, to make money, to have a laugh, to keep him like buzzing with stuff to do and to also help me get in a situation where I could carry on seeing him at the prison and I could get involved in his legal battle because he wasn't doing very well at the time. He was beating, still beating prisoners up, um, prison guards and everything up at the time. So, you know, his behaviour was, you know, going down early. You know, he had charges coming up where he was appearing in court and all the rest of it. So I said to him, listen, I said, let's do it then. So he said to me, right, Prove to me how good you are. So I said, right, what do you mean? And he said, get me on the front page of the Sunday papers. And I was like, fucking hell. This was like Thursday. So I said, right, okay. I'll prove, I'll, I'll prove myself. So I said to him, do you want a baby? And he went, a fucking baby? What do I want a fucking baby for? I said, well, you don't want a baby. I said, but just tell me you want a baby. Write me a fucking letter tomorrow. Ring me. Tell me you want a baby and I'll get you on the front page of the Sunday papers. And he went, right, right, let's do it then, let's do it. So he wrote a letter to me saying, right, I want a baby with Paula, da 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 and all this sort of stuff. So, sold the story to the papers, got it on the front page of the Sunday papers, headline, Bronson, I want a baby. Monday morning, phone, no, Sunday night, phone me up. You're a fucking genius, it's fucking brilliant, I can't believe it. All the screws are talking about it, all the prison lads are talking about it, and all the rest of it. So, we started having a laugh, right? And we started earning a few quid. And every single penny that we earned, I took 50% of everything that we did. The other 50% went to one of his friends to do with whatever they wanted to do with. That's all I'm gonna say about that. So every single deal that we ever did with the newspapers, TV, anything like that, it wasn't just me going out, like, doing stories and planting these things and getting all this publicity. It was me saying to Charlie, right, what do you think about this idea? What do you think about that idea? Yeah, do it. Brilliant. What do you think about this idea? It's shit. Right, we'll leave that one. What about this one? Yeah, it's brilliant. Let's do it. So basically, we just literally ripped the shit out of the prison service because what I'd done was I went back to the to the Ministry of Justice and I said, why are you banning me from seeing my dad? And they went, what do you mean? I said, Charles Bronson's my dad. And they went, is he? And I went, yeah, it's my fucking dad. I said, I've not seen it. I've been in a children's home since 1971. And then what I'd done was, <clears throat> I spoke to Charlie and we'd been sending each other all these coded letters and everything. 
So I started getting Charlie to write to me and tell me things about my mom and about my childhood that I already knew, that he never knew. But because he was writing to me with all these letters, saying, oh, your mum was this, your mum was that, I met her in this place, I met her in that, she was off her head, and all these details about my mum, all these letters that were being sent to me were all being read by the prison service. So in the end, the prison service contacted me and said, right, we want to arrange for you to come back and start visiting Charlie. So I said, well, what, what's, what, why, why is the change of heart? And they went, well, we know he's your dad and we can't break any family ties and we want to keep that family tie together so you can come back and start visiting him. So I've turned up to visit him again and next thing, I've got a fucking badge when you go in for the visitor's badge and it says your name, George Bambi, and then it says friend. And then on this occasion, I went to visit him, George Bambi, and it said son underneath. So I've got in, so I've walked into the uh, maximum security unit. I think at this time he was at Franklin Prison. And I've walked in, he's gone, all right, son. And I've gone, uh, all right, dad. And he's gone, do you know what? It fucking hell, it's fucking, it's mad. We've even got the same nose. We've even got the same jawline. And he starts going on about all this. And me and him are just like laughing to each other and pissing about and all the rest of it. And, uh, and that was it. That was the agreement that me and Charlie had. You know, I worked as a PR agent for him. And, you know, we, we had a really good laugh. We, we pulled the wool over the uh, eyes of the prison service. Um, and everybody knows Charlie loves being in the papers. I mean, he used to ring me up with some ludicrous stuff sometimes. I mean, he'd ring me up saying, right, uh, George, uh, I've had me done it today. I should have had five spuds and there's only four. Right, get it exposed. Get it in the Sunday Star this week. And I'm like, Charlie doesn't work like that. They're not interested in how many fucking potatoes you've had this Sunday. Let's think of something else. So then we sit there and then he'd ring me and he'd go, right, I've got this idea. Or I'd say, right, I've got that idea. So we'd just keep coming up with these ideas and the ideas were absolutely ridiculous. So I said to him one day, I said, right, should we go for another front page Sunday paper? I'd be like, yeah, 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 yeah. What, what, what have you got? What have you got? So I said, well, have you ever done a will? And he went, no. I said, well, why don't you do a will, right, and send it to me and tell me that when you die, you want your body handed over to me and you want your brain pickled, put in a jar in my crime museum. And he went, fucking brilliant. So he sent me a letter over through his solicitor, all signed and everything, dead official. When I die, I want my brain handed over to George Bambi, my son, put in a jar, pickled and put in his museum. So sent the letter over, front page of the Sunday papers. He absolutely loved it. He used to ring me and we'd just be laughing our heads off. I mean, we were just literally running rings around the papers. We were just making up all sorts of fucking nonsense. But to me, it was good because obviously, I mean, you know, I was making money out of it. I can't say Charlie was making money out of it, but I was making 50% of everything that we made. We'll just leave it at that. Charlie was really, really happy. Um, he was enjoying himself. You know, um, for the last six years, I've been paying his canteen. Every single week, he gets 50 quid to spend at canteen in prison. Some prisoners only get like a fiver if they've not got any family or whatever. Charlie always had his full time, and every week for the last five or six years, I've always paid him every single week so he can eat what he does, whatever. Nice little nest egg that he's got. Well indirectly whatever through one of his friends that's between charlie and, and and whoever i don't get involved in that um any um any deals that we do have always been completely open been completely honest we've had a brilliant relationship over the years we've had a cracking relationship and then he starts saying right i want you to get me on the telly i want you to get me on this program i want you to get me on that program so i'm, I'm organizing all these programs getting him on getting his face on the telly and then we started seeing each other and it was it, it got it got just fucking too much for me because then he wanted me to start managing paula so i'm managing paula and i'm managing like the uk's most notorious violent prisoner in the prison system and i'm like how the fuck have i got involved in this i'm enjoying it and I'm enjoying the process. But the thing was, I struck up a really, really close friendship with Charlie. And we got on really, really well. We had a, we had a mega laugh. I'd go and see him every two weeks. 
uh, most most of the time, you know, I might miss a miss a month there or there, but generally, I'd see him. You know, I'd see him ten, twelve times a year. Have canteen, we'd sit there, eat loads of food, and we'd be coming up with our next idea of whatever we wanted to do. And we'd be sitting there laughing our bollocks off and chuckling and all this and whatever. And then you've got all these, you know, all these fucking followers online. Oh, this is Charlie's. That's not doing Charlie any good. Being in the papers and doing this and doing that and whatever. And I'm saying to Charlie, all these people are saying, this is all bollocks with the paper. You shouldn't be doing it. Fuck them. Fuck them. This is me and you. It's nothing to do with anyone else. Tell them to keep their mind out of their own business. This is our business. Nothing to do with anyone else. And that's it. So I just carried on, you know, working with Charlie. And um, over a period of time, we had a really, really good relationship. And I got really close to him. And I got that close to him. It was actually like having a father and son relationship. I mean, fucking used to hug when we'd go in. We'd have a fucking hug when we left. We'd, you know, you know, he'd tell me how proud I was of him. I'd tell him how proud I was of him, behaving himself. And then, after a while, I got to the stage where I was thinking, he shouldn't fucking be in, he shouldn't be in this prison. He shouldn't be in here. And I was thinking to myself, why, why is he still in? And then... Um, I was doing loads of, loads of stuff with Paula. And then he turned around one day and said he's getting married to Paula. He said to me, right, I want you to arrange the wedding. I was like, fucking hell. So I'm arranging this wedding. He's ringing me every half an hour. Right, get a dwarf. Um, right, uh, get this. Get, get someone uh, juggling. I want some llamas. I want this. And it was ridiculous. Organised this wedding anyway. Sorted all the wedding out. And um, the wedding went ahead. Paula... Obviously, you know, she was there getting married at Wakefield. We did a deal with the papers. All the money and everything went to Paula. I took my 50%. Paula got her 50%. So everything I did with Paula, she got 50% of everything. So then I was taking on Loose Women. I was taking on Lorraine this morning. All the different programmes. I mean, it was ridiculous. I mean, we were literally just walking around and getting three grand off that show. Walking in the next studio on Lorraine, getting another three grand. Walking in the next studio, getting another two grand off them. It was ridiculous. It was, it, it, was a, it was a farce. But Paul was making a good few quid. I was making a good few quid. And it was good fun. It was, it, it, it was good fun. Um, now, people watching this will be saying... You know, is it good fun? You're talking about someone's life here and all the rest of it. What they need to remember is everything I've ever done with Charlie has always been with his complete and full knowledge and his approval before I've done anything that we've ever done. So, um... I think that's the main thing, though. I think... Listen, when I had you on, <clears throat> I found that you're an investigator, journalist. You've done all the paparazzi stuff. Yeah, but everyone knew uh, that yeah, straight away. Had you Charlie Bronson Sanders question marks, but then you had Charlie phone, and I thought possible. Right, possible. you know, you know, when we're on the show. Yeah. Last time I was on the show. Yeah. And um, Charlie Bronson happened to ring up in the middle of the podcast, mm -hmm. and I was like, "Oh, hello, Charlie. I'm on yeah. the James English show." I spoke to him a couple of nights before and said, "I'm going on the James English podcast in a couple of days." Who's fucking James English? I went, "Well, it's this right ugly bastard from Glasgow <laughs> that fucking talks loads of shit to loads of people. <laughs> he talks more shit than me, Charlie. <laughs> fucking brilliant." <laughs> so uh, he goes, "Right, right." Get me on it. Get me on the show. So I said, right. I said, well, I'm doing the podcast tomorrow, one o'clock or whatever. Ring me, half one, on the dot. I'll put me, leave me phone on. When you ring me, just be aware that you are going to be on the James English podcast. So watch what you say. Be careful what you say. Blah, blah, blah. So anyway, we're having a little chat. Half 12, the phone goes, hiya, Dad. Hiya, son. How are you? All right. Where are you? And then we start having a chat. I'm like... Fucking hell, that's weird, wasn't it? Charlie phoned me. I can't believe it. That was really good timing. Phone down. I'm a journalist. It's what I fucking do. Yeah. I set things up with the media. Soon as I came on the show and, like, soon as we started the ball rolling, the, the, one, the one thing that really, really upsets me about this whole thing, soon as the father and son thing started rolling, it just gathered pace. It gathered more pace and more pace and more pace. Then you've got all these podcasters, all these knobheads online going, that ain't fucking Charlie Bronson, Sally. He's a fucking fraud. He's mugging Charlie off. He's, Charlie doesn't know what the fuck's going on in prison. He's taking the piss out of him. He's living off his name. He's living a lavish lifestyle on the back of Charlie. I was fucking worth fucking... I was a millionaire fucking five years before I met Charlie. I've got loads of businesses. I've got a fucking house paid off. I'm retired. 
You know, that you know, all these people saying that I've made money off Charlie. Me and Charlie had a business arrangement and it was a really good business arrangement and we did really, really well. So, you know, it is what it is. But came to the stage where with me working like undercover as you as you would say, me and Charlie made a pact that if we did this, we would never tell anybody that I wasn't his biological son, right? So I said, right, okay, if that's how we're going to do it, that's how we're going to do it. I won't even tell members of my family. So I didn't even tell my wife, didn't even tell my son. Didn't, I didn't tell anybody. Charlie didn't tell any of his family, um, didn't tell his mum, didn't tell his brother. And I'm like, well, what's going to happen? You know, they're going to fucking say something. And he's like... It's fuck all to do with them. It's business. It's nothing to do with them. Tell them to keep the fucking noses out. I'll fucking deal with it, and that's it. And I was like, right, okay. Uh, I mean, my life was fucked up anyway. I mean, I was brought up in a kid's home, never had any family, don't have fuck all to do with my mum. My dad's dead. Uh, never, ever met him in my whole life. Um, so never had a dad. It all worked out like it was... It, it was it was engineered and it was perfectly sort of put together. But then I saw a podcast the other day and I was reading something which made me think to myself, right, before that, we did this doc, just so people know, we've been working on this documentary for about three years. And when we used to speak on the phone, we used to call the people, because I was working for Channel 4, and my remit was to get video footage and photographs of Charles Bronson for the TV. Something that nobody had ever been sex successful at doing in the past. Because the prison service, Dennis Nielsen, all these other people, they allowed the cameras to go in and interview them. They would never ever let the cameras go in to interview Charlie because they worried about what, they were gonna, what he was gonna say because of all the fucking brutality that he'd suffered. Because he used to get brutalized all the time. They never, ever wanted Charlie to have a say, to be able to say anything. So, if you walk into a prison with a camera and you film something, or you've got covert cameras on you, you're looking at two years inside. So, that wasn't an option. I remember the second, I think it was the second time I went to see him. Oh, no, the, it was the first time I went to see him. He went, he looked at me and he goes, right. I've seen these things on the telly. And I went, what? And he went, I've got an idea. And Charlie had some great ideas, but he had some fucking stupid ideas, which was funny. We used to piss ourselves. And he goes, every morning, 10 o'clock in the morning, I go out on the exercise yard. Tomorrow, get one of them satellites from space, get the picture to zoom down, and I'll lie on my back on the floor doing press-ups, and you can get some pictures and videos of me. I said, Charlie, from a fucking satellite in space, are you having a fucking laugh? <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? I've seen him on the telly. And I said, no, it doesn't work like that, Charlie. It doesn't work. Anyway, so we'll have a bit of a laugh about it. So Charlie goes, right, you're my son now. This is obviously moving later on. We can have pictures taken together. So we had some pictures taken together. Charlie said, right, get me the papers. Get me the papers. Sell them. Get me the papers. So we did that. All the, the thing with the, the son was gathering momentum and all the rest of it. And then he never liked technology. Never has technology. So in his cell, he's got a dab radio. He's got a telly, that's it. He's allowed a PlayStation. He won't have one. DVD player. He won't have one. I said, why don't you get a DVD player? And you can watch the film, Bronson. Fucking watch it if you... No, I'm not having a fucking DVD player. I'm not having to... I'm not having it. I'm not doing it. And that's it. And, and when Charlie says something, he means it. And he's very unreasonable sometimes with his stubbornness because... Unless you explain to him what you're actually talking about or what you're trying to get at, so he, you know, he acknowledges what you're actually talking about, he'll just turn it down and that will be it. There'll be no talking about it again. It's fucking, I've made my mind up and that's it. So we've had fucking loads of rows over the years, loads of times. Done, I did a newspaper article once. Um, he said, right, I said... All your artwork, you've got pictures of stabbing people and fucking guns and blood and all that shit everywhere. I said, why don't you try and do a nice piece of artwork? Well, all his artwork's nice, obviously. I'm not, don't really like that. Why don't you do a nice piece of artwork and um, 
where do you want to live when you come out of prison? He said, I want to live in a caravan. I said, well, do a nice, nice picture of a caravan. Do a really nice picture of a caravan and do some flowers. I'm not fucking doing flowers. Fucking flowers. I said, just do a nice picture of a caravan and picture where you're going to be when you come out with some fence posts and fucking trees and all that. And, you know, show me what's on your mind, where you want to be when you come out. So he did this picture, uh, the caravan, and it was absolutely sensational, absolutely unbelievable. It had flowers on it. It had the fucking sun. It had the sea in the background, this caravan, da 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 da, da. And it was amazing. And then you look closer, and the caravan's got bars on the windows, and it's got cameras on the top of the caravan. It's got barbed wire on the top. and all. I'm like, why, is, wh wh why have you got all that? And he's like, well, when I come out in my fucking caravan, I'm having bars on my windows. And I'm like, why do you want bars on your windows if you get out? And he went, well, I fucking had bars on my windows for 49 years. I want fucking bars on my windows. I'll have bars on my windows. And that's how the system has got him. Like, mentally, that, that's how he's been programmed. So anyway, going back to, um, going back to this program with Channel 4, he said to me ages ago, I want my own program on the telly. He said, there's loads of programs you've done for me in the past where I've been mentioned and I've been on them and I've, you know, I've been blah, blah, blah. I want my own program and I want to be able to tell my own story. And I want to be able to people to see me on the telly talking and telling my story. So I said, right, okay. I said, well, we're going to have to work out a way that we can do it because I can't come in with covert cameras and start filming you because it's illegal and I'll end up getting locked up. And he's like, well, don't fucking worry about that if you get locked up. I'll get you looked after. You'll be looked after like a fucking lord in like a couple of years. You'll be out in 12 months. You'll have the best fucking time. All the boys are... And I said, Charlie, I'm not fucking going to prison by smuggling the covert camera. So it's not fucking happening. That's it. Right, how's, how are we going to do it? So anyway, I, I, obviously, I, you know, I've been working for Channel 4 for years. And um, I actually put this idea to Channel 4 five, four or five years ago to say... I'm doing this undercover programme with Charles Bronson. I want to expose what's been happening to him inside, the brutality, uh, the way the system's let him down and all the rest of it. And I want to do this programme undercover. And um, they knew I wasn't his son. Channel 4 knew I wasn't his son because I pitched the idea to him not being his son. So they said, oh... No, we're not really interested. We don't want to do a programme on Charles Bronson. There's loads of programmes on Charles Bronson. You need something different. I got them to sign an agreement to say, an, a non-disclosure agreement, so that they wouldn't talk about it. I pitched the programme and said, I'm not Charles Bronson's son. I'm undercover. I'm in there. I'm in the maximum security facility as a reporter. The only one that's ever got in to see Charles Bronson. I go to see him all the time. I go to all his management meetings... So every month, I go and sit down, and there's me and Charlie and his lawyer, Dean. Then there's a the psychologist, there's the parole officer, there's his wing commander, there's this, there's that, there's, there's all these people. Sit there for an hour and just talk about how Charlie's been getting on for the whole month and what we can do to improve it and what he can do to improve his outlook to try and get him out and all the rest of it. I said, listen, this is a fucking great programme. So they said, well, we can't put the programme together because we need, you know, we need footage of Charles Bronson. We need Charles, you know, that's what we need. So um, they, I said, well, why don't you just do a program about Charles Bronson? I'll do all these phone calls. I'll talk to him, you know, all the letters. And they're, and they're like, no, no, it doesn't work for us, whatever. So I said, right, fine, no worries. So I said to him, I will get you video footage. I will get you video footage of Charles Bronson. And I'll get you video footage of Charles Bronson telling his story. And if I do that, have we got a deal? So they were like, if you do that, you fucking know you've got a deal. So there was nothing more said about it. Then, COVID came along a year or so after. So COVID came along. So I'm on these visits with Charlie. Um, and I knew COVID was happening and all the rest of it. So on these visits, blah, blah, blah. And then all the visits just stopped because obviously with the lockdown and everything. But because I was Charlie's son or portraying myself to be Charlie's son with Charlie's obviously full backing and full knowledge, 
they couldn't stop us visiting each other. So I wrote to the Home Office and I said, listen, you can't stop me visiting my dad for 12 months. You, you can't do it. You need to organise something for me to see him. <clears throat> so they came back, which I thought they would, um, with a thing called Purple Visits, which meant that because he's a Cat A, double Cat A prisoner in the maximum security unit, they'd take him into a cell. And it was like, a, you know, like when you get a prisoner that gives evidence at court. So they you know, they sit in this, sit in this special cell, they're on a link, and the link came to my iPad at home, which was a really big iPad I bought. I paid a couple of grand for it, proper big 4K, big screen and all the rest of it. So <clears throat> we started having purple visits. Three or four days before this, I said to him, right, I've got a deal with one of the CB companies. And he went, what do you mean? I said, I've got a two part deal, two one hour specials, prime time TV with the big boys. And he went, who's the big boys? I went, <clears throat> well, I can't tell you who the big boys are, but when I say the big boys, you know who I'm talking about. You know I'm talking about the TV people. And he said, yeah, 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 yeah. So I said, right. I said, so what is your dream? What do you want to do? This whole thing has been about me exposing the system on your behalf and giving you the opportunity to tell your story. You've done loads of phone calls with people and there's been a few phone calls on the internet and all the rest of it. People are fucking bored with phone calls. They want to see your face. So he went, yeah, yeah, well, how are you going to get my face on that? And I said, I turned around and I said, right, they've got this thing called Purple Visits where you go into a room and we talk to each other on video. And he went, oh, fuck off. I'm not doing that. I'm not fucking doing it. I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. I went, Charlie, if you want to do what we want to do, you need to do it. Fuck off, I'm not doing it. I'm not fucking standing there talking to a fucking screen and looking at you and you looking at me on the other fucking screen. That's not a fucking visit. We can't have a coffee. We can't have a Magnum ice cream. We can't have a sandwich. I said, Charlie, when you go to bed tonight, just think about what I'm saying to you, right? Just think about what I'm saying to you. Um, and then he said, right, well, I'm not even going to fucking think about it. I'm not fucking doing it. And that's it. I'm not doing it. So I said, I'm not fucking about with technology. I'm not doing it. So when we write to each other, we have certain codes and certain ways that we can write things where he can read freely what I'm saying and I can read freely what he's saying. But the screws can't read what we're saying, if that makes sense. Basically fucking coded letters. So basically in one of the letters I said to him, listen, right, I've done a fucking deal with Channel 4, two one-hour episodes, yeah, and when you're talking to me, I'm going to be at home with a big screen in front of me, your face will be on that screen and I will be talking to you, and when I'm doing that, I will have Channel 4 in my house videoing you on the screen talking to me. That's what I said in the coded letter. So I sent the coded letter off, uh, I'm allowed to email him. So, so I, e I emailed him the, the letter off. Um, about half ten the next morning, ba -bing, email comes through from the prison service. Your purple visits has been approved, right? So he's rang me up. He's gone, right, um, right, mum's the word, mum's the word. And that means don't say anything. I went, yeah, yeah, mum's the word, mum's the word. What, what? And he went, right. Um, have you had, um, have you had a little purple visits invitation to, um, visit me, um, by television? And I went, yes, I have. And he went, right, mum's a word, say no more, say no more. So I wrote to him, I said, listen, you need to understand every purple visit that we have is going to be recorded, Right. Whatever you say to me on these half an hour visits for the next 12 months, it went on for about 12 months. Whatever you say to me for the half an hour on each of these visits will be recorded and it will be, it will be on channel four. There'll be certain bits that are in it, be certain bits that are not in it. <clears throat> I have no control over what they put in the program and what they don't put in the program. So you need to bear that in mind. So don't say anything in that visit that you don't expect to be on the telly, right? He said, right, I completely understand. I've got you, completely understand. Fucking buzzing, can't wait, I'm fucking buzzing. 
So we had our first visit. So I've got all the fucking crew in the house, videoing all the uh, videoing all the visits and all that. So we've done the visit, and as we've done the visit, we finished the visit. We've had a good chat. I'm like, all right, Dad, how you doing? And he's like, look at the screen. He goes, fucking hell. It's fucking mental. I can fucking see you. Fuck, that fucking picture in the kitchen. And, and you'd seen it on the TV show that we did. You could, you know, you could see him clearly on the screen. He could see into my house. He could see me. He completely understood <clears throat> what was happening. End of the first half an hour visit goes, the phone rings literally 30 seconds after. I pick the phone up. Hello? Fucking hell! Did, did Channel 4 film it? Did they fucking get me? Did they get that bit about? I'm like, Charlie, shut the fuck up, Mr. Lee. Don't say a fucking word. Don't say. Ring me back in a bit. Ring back in five minutes. Phone down. Two minutes later. Right, right. What's happening? What's happening? Have they filmed it all? It's brilliant. Did you get that joke I said about this and blah, blah? I'm like, Charlie, well, ring me back in an hour. Anyway, Ch Channel 4 have gone. So he's rang me back. So I thought to myself, we've got half an hour footage. He said loads of things that he wanted to say. But I wanted to keep it going because I wanted to start talking about the brutality that he'd experienced and about, you know, prison officers going into his cell at fucking two o'clock in the morning, 12 of them, and kicking the shit out of him while he's asleep in bed, dragging him out of bed and battering him and everything that he went through because he was, he was traumatised. When I go and visit him, he's got fucking scars all over his head, his neck, his face, his arms, everywhere, where he's had the shit kicked out of him. So, started speaking a bit more openly and a bit more freely on the phone because I thought, fucking, if they bubble us or whatever, Charlie's said loads of stuff. They've got enough for a show. Charlie wanted to get his word out there and all the rest of it. So we've done all that. So we started speaking on the phone and I just said to him, I said, listen, has that gone off? No. All right. So me and Charlie started having more regular phone conversations. And when I say more regular phone conversations, you're ringing me every fucking two minutes. It was a nightmare. I love talking to him, get on great with him. But when he gets something in his head, you can't get him off the phone. So he rings for 15 minutes, then they cut him off. Then he rings for another 15 minutes, then they cut him off. Then he rings again, and it fucking goes on all night. So when he knew that we were doing this program, I said to him, right, I'm getting X amount of money, right? You're not allowed any of this money. So what I did was I did it through my crime museum. So I charged Channel 4, yeah, to do the programme. And then when the programme was finished, another company invoiced me for a consultancy fee for, for doing work for the programme, and that invoice was paid. Now, what happens to that money is nothing to do with me because I can't physically give that to Charlie. I'm not allowed to give it to him. He's not allowed to earn any money from it. So this consultant that was working for us got paid a really decent sum of money. So, and that consultant, very good friend of Charlie's. So I'll let you, you know, draw your own conclusions. Nothing to do with me. So at this stage, we've got loads of TV stuff. It starts ringing me all the time. So I said, right, Charlie, let's fucking get this sorted out. Let's do things properly, right? Let's fucking get to work on getting you out. So going back a year or so before, 18 months before, all the wedding and all that sort of stuff, or a couple of years before, whatever it was, all the wedding stuff was going on. He had this lawyer. And at the wedding, I was looking at his lawyer. No one's allowed any cameras in there because... Paula, I'd done a deal for Paula with the newspapers where she got a good few thousand quid. Basically paid for all the wedding and Paula had a few grand on top and I had a few grand on top. I mean, you know, I'm doing a job. At the end of the day, as brutal as this may, may, may sound, I'm not Charles Bronson's son. I'm a PR agent and this whole thing has been a job, right? The fact that me and Charlie become very close and become very pally and we've fucking got on like an house on fire and got on great... It's just basically how the journey's transpired. But the culmination of it is, this has just been a job. Even though I've thoroughly enjoyed it, I've done some great things. Says Charlie, right, we need to get you sorted now. Get you out, um, get you out of prison. So at the wedding, I saw his solicitor, it's the first time I ever met him. He's fucking stood there, he's pissed, he's taking loads of selfies. Oh, I'm fucking Charles Bronson's solicitor, where are you fucking here? I'll have a picture of me. I thought to myself, who the fuck's this clown? So I've looked him up and I've looked all the work he's done. I thought, he's not doing fuck all for Charlie. Everything he's doing is for himself. I'm fucking Charles Bronson's solicitor. That's, you know, that was the thing. So 
I said to Charlie, right. I said, this ain't fucking right. I said, we need to get you another legal team. So at this stage, people don't understand Charlie. They don't understand how he works. He's a very clever guy. And he has a lot of people on the outside doing things for him. There's a lot of people that have little fucking jobs that they do for him, sending him postcards and selling artwork and whatever they do. But, you know, that's nothing to do with me. That's their business. He sends me artwork and I sell artwork for him. And, you know, we have an agreement. There's nothing to do with anyone else. And that's it. So he had this little fucking parasite that was running around for him called Rod Harrison. When I came on the scene and I said I was Charlie's son, Rod Harrison was his best mate. He was his best man at the wedding, did everything for him. I was like, oh, fucking hell. If you want anything to do with Charlie, you need to go through Rod. Rod is the fucking Mr. Big in the whole operation. He's fucking Mr. Big. He's the, the big cheese. And this Rod, he had Facebook groups on and fucking this. And he, he was controlling Charlie's life, telling him what he could do, what he couldn't do, telling people who could write to him, who couldn't write to him, and all the rest of this fucking bollocks. So I thought, he's fucking got to go. The solicitor's got to go. He had a lookalike at the wedding, looked like Charlie. He had to fucking go. There was loads of people involved in Charlie's circle that were making a fucking mockery out of him that had to go. They had to fucking, they had to get out of Dodge. They were making him look a complete twat. So after the wedding, a lot of things changed. Um, so then the father and the son thing was you know, gathering momentum. Then this fucking Rod Harrison and all his gang of fucking cronies and all that. That's not his son. Charlie said he's definitely not his son. He's definitely not his son. He's a fucking fraud. He's this, that, and the other. So I was speaking to the phone on Charlie and speaking to Charlie on the phone going, Charlie, this fucking Rod and whatever, telling everyone I'm not your fucking... Oh, I'll have a word with him. I'll fucking tell him he shouldn't be saying that. Right, okay. Next week, someone else is fucking said. Someone else is said. I said, right, Charlie, I'm not fucking about anymore. You need to sort it out, right? Because me and you have got a business arrangement, right? We're both very clever people. We both know what we're doing. We both agreed to everything at the start. And this fucking guy's making us both look like a pair of twats. And he's like, right, fucking, I'll speak to him. Don't worry, don't worry. Anyway, nothing happened again. He rang me up and he said, right, I spoke to him. He'll never mention it again. I've told him, don't fucking get involved in my business. Carry on fucking sending the postcards, doing this, fucking doing all Because he was this little fucking fag, if you like. He used to go off and do all his fucking jobs for him and run around left, right and centre thinking he was Mr. Big, Big, fucking Billy Big Bollocks, selling all his art, making loads of fucking money. Fair play to him. As long as he was giving Charlie his fucking chair out of it, it's entirely up to him. So he's doing all this. Next thing, this story comes out in the in the mirror and the story of the mirror came out saying um charles bronson cuts all contact with his son everything's a fucking lie it's just after his five minutes bit of fame or whatever and um it's not his son charlie's cut all contacts with him this, this is 2017 don't want anything to fucking do with him and that's it finished so charlie didn't ring me for a few days and i thought fucking strange what's going on here so uh, I wrote to him and I said, you need to fucking ring me. So he rang me and he went, I said, what's up? And he went, I said, what the fuck's this all about? In the paper, no fucking no contact with me and all this, whatever. He goes, what are you on about? And this Rod Harrison had put something online saying, Charlie doesn't want anything to do with fucking George. He's a liar. He's a fucking this. Da, 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 da. And he put it on the Facebook group. And on this Facebook group, it's with all the fucking cronies follow it. There's some really nice, genuine people that have genuinely got Charlie's interests at heart, which is great. There's also a lot of fucking dickheads on there. So what was happening is um, the press were all being his friends on Facebook, because obviously anything that went on there, they were setting up fake profiles and all sorts of shit to find out about Charlie's and they put stories in there. That's where the mirror and the story from. Then they contacted Rod. He gave him some sort of quote. So I got a copy of the mirror. I sent it to Charlie. I went, right, fucking deal's off. There's the paper. You fucking made me look like a twat. You've not kept your side of the story. Charlie went fucking, went absolutely ballistic. What the fucking hell of that little fucking twat? Why the fuck is, I fucking told him not to get involved in my fucking business. And he just cut Rod Harrison off straight away. Just cut him off stone dead. I had nothing more to do with him. I'll fucking kill him. He's a fucking rat. He's this, he's that, fucking the other, whatever. I said, so what's happening then? Are we carrying on with the fucking father's son? Fucking right we are. Fucking right we are. 
So we just carried on, carried on for a few years. I said, right, then we go back to the bit about me trying to get him out of prison. So I found the solicitor up. I said, right, Charlie, I want to look after all your legal stuff. I want to get you the best possible representation that you can possibly have. Not some fucking solicitor in Leeds that sits in the fucking courtroom waiting for someone to rob a packet of bacon off the shelf and go and fucking get his legal aid money or whatever. I wanted a proper professional. So I contacted a really, really good friend of mine at ITV that's absolutely wonderful. I'll just say her first name's Claire. I'm not going to say her surname or whatever, but she's absolutely amazing. She was really helpful. So through my contact with Claire and some contacts I had at ITV and the legal team or whatever, um, we got to work to find out who the best possible legal representation could possibly be. And there was only two people in the country that could do it. One of them had just retired, and the other one was a guy called Dean Kingham. And Dean Kingham was the guy that got Harry Roberts out of prison. Harry Roberts killed three police officers. He said, never get out. And on top of this, Dean Kingham was a specialist at working with prisoners that were in segregation, solitary confinement, the CSC unit, which is the most secure place in the fucking country. And he's the only one that had experience, and he's the only one that ever got anyone out of the CSC unit. So I got in touch with Dean and I said, Dean, I want you to take this case on for He's like, no, no, no. I said, no, I really, really want you to do it. You really need to look at this case. This fucking guy's been brutalized for years. He's, he's a product of the system. They fucking completely ruined him. They've turned him into a fucking animal and now they've got him locked in a fucking cage and won't let him out. They won't let any media access to him. They won't give him any, you know, any help whatsoever. And he's got this complete fucking donor that's been representing him. I need you to get involved in this. Anyway, I ended up going to the offices. I fucking did all sorts. I got on my knees. I just said, look, fucking please. He went, right, I'll go and see him. I was like, yes. So he went to see Charlie. They got on like a house on fire. And that was it. We had the best legal team behind us in the fucking country. The best in the country. Next thing, you've got all these Rod Harrisons and all these fucking idiots online. Um, oh, yeah, um, Charlie's got a new legal team that I've sorted out for him now. No, you fucking didn't, Rod Harrison. You're an absolute lying twat. No, you didn't. I got his legal team sorted for him. So, regardless of who got it or whatever, he got the best legal team, and it was me that got that legal team for him. So, spent hours and hours and hours traveling to see Dean and speak to him on the phone every day, doing all the legal stuff, getting all the psychology reports and blah, 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 all the parole stuff. And then one day I said to Dean, I said, right, these parole hearings, he just goes in a room, there's three random people there, he sits there for a couple of hours, he chats shy, and then they just say no and send him back to his fucking cell for another two years. I said, that's how it goes, isn't it? And he said, yeah, it is. So I said to him, right, why can't we get a parole hearing? I said, if a prison or a, a, if a judge is good enough to, and a jury is good enough to send someone to prison for, for a life sentence, then surely a judge or, the, or, or the, the public are good enough to decide whether he comes out again. So Dean said, never happen. Never get a public parole hearing. There's absolutely fucking no chance. That's how the pr parole system works. So I said, well, I don't give a fuck how the parole system works. I want a public hearing for Charlie where his parole hearing is going to be heard in public. So all the press can go, everyone in the world can fucking see it, and everybody can see what's going on and know everything about all the facts, all the statements, all the brutal brutality. They've given him fucking PTSD, AD, whatever, you know, fucking psycho, all sorts of stuff. They, they've completely fucking brutalised him. So the solicitor said it won't work. So I wrote to Dominic Raab and I went to see, I went to see Anne Whittaker, who was the head of the minister, uh, Ministry of Justice a few years ago. Knocked on the door in Davin, she lived near me. Knocked on the door, went in and went, all right, Anne, nice to meet you, yeah, you all right? I said, do you mind if I come in? There's a little bit of a community thing I want to talk to you about. She said, yeah, yeah, no worries, I was with me, I was with me missus. So she said, I'll put a coffee on. So she walked in the kitchen, made a coffee, and we fucking sat there with Anne Whittacombe having a coffee. I said, right, can I just ask you a question? Why didn't you ever contemplate releasing Charles Bronson from prison? And she went, well, he's a murderer. I'd never, I'd never have signed the paperwork for him. And I said, how many people did he murder? And she went, well, I don't know. I'd have to look at the records. I think it was like four or five or something. And then she turned around and she said, 
what, what, why are you interested in this? And I said, oh, I'm his son. And she like nearly fucking spat a tea all over me. So I said, this is the problem with Charlie. You're, you were the Minister of Justice for the government and you wouldn't sign the paperwork because as soon as the paperwork arrived, you thought he was a murderer. I said, he's never murdered anybody. That's what you were dealing with. Then I wrote to Dominic Robb and I said, right, fucking forget this parole system behind closed doors. You keep calling him into a room every two years, sitting there for an hour and a half, and then telling him to fuck off back to his cell. He's never getting out again. I said, I want this public. I want the press to be involved. And Dominic Raab turned around and he said, never happen. Um, yeah, but thanks for the letter. I've still got the fucking letter home. Yeah, thanks for writing, Mr. Bambi. Um, yeah, but the parole system is the parole system. And that's how it works and it will never change. Dominic Raab, fucking whatever. So I got this letter. So I thought, fuck you. I'm not fucking settling for that. So I said to Dean, right, get a fucking judicial review. Get the fucking lawyers you know get, get get to work and all the rest of it so anyway cut a long story short we took the ministry of justice and the government to court we took them to court and we fucking won we, we won the case so as a result of three years of legal shite that took us fucking ages right we won the case and we got the right for charlie i me personally with Dean, the lawyers, got the right for Charlie to have a public parole hearing. So that means his parole hearing was going to be heard at the High Courts of Justice in London. The whole press was going to be there. The whole fucking world media was going to be there. And it was a perfect opportunity for Charlie's story to be told all around the country and all around the world. It was going to be in every paper, every newspaper, every internet site, every news channel, TV channel, the fucking lot. It was going to be everywhere which was absolutely brilliant, right? So I've absolutely worked my bollocks off to get this legal team, right? We've beaten the government. We beat the Ministry of Justice at their own game. We've got an open parole hearing. I've worked my fucking arse off. I've not slept for fucking weeks on end. Constantly Googling this, Googling that, looking up case law and fucking all sorts of stuff. The same time, I'm visiting Charlie, and I'm, I'm going to visit parole officers that have worked for the parole service before, and I'm saying, what has Charlie got to, what has my dad got to do to get out? Because at the time, he was my dad. Whatever. So, what has my dad got to do to get out of prison? And these are ex-parole people, and they're saying, right, the main criteria, he needs to show remorse for his crimes. Yeah. The other one, he's got to be safe. We've got to be 100% sure that if we lose him into the community, he's got to be safe. So the next fucking, oh my God, two months. I'm, trying to, I'm going on these visits with Charlie. I'm talking to him. When we're doing the video visits that's being recorded with Channel 4, I'm saying to him the night before, I'm going to talk to you about something tomorrow called remorse. You need to listen to me, what I'm talking to you about, because I'm talking about remorse and what the parole board want to hear. Yeah, all right, fucking whatever. I'll just ring you and we'll fucking talk about whatever. So don't forget, it's all been recorded. So he rings me up. Uh, the video visit starts. I'm saying, right, Charlie, talk to me about Phil Danielson. Talk to me about what happened. I was giving him the opportunity to tell me from his side what happened with Phil Danielson. And Charlie was like, yeah, I overreacted, you know. And I'm like, well, you didn't overreact, Charlie. You did something that was pretty fucking terrifying for the poor guy. You kept him hostage for three days. Yeah, but, you know, I, I didn't hurt him. I was tickling him and I fed him and all this. And, and I'm like, yeah, but Charlie, the parole's coming up, right? You need to talk properly. It does talk properly. I'm, I'm not saying that. I said, but you need to talk methodically and you need to show that you're remorseful for what you've done. And I said, do you know the difference between regret and remorse? And he said, yeah. I said, well, go on then. I said, I'm the parole officer. You're in front of me. I'm just saying to you now, you took Phil Danielson hostage. Why should I let you out? And he turned around and he goes, right. He says, I'll tell you now, I don't regret anything in life. I've had a fucking great life. I don't regret anything. It was what it was and that was it. And I'm like, right, you can't say that. I'm fucking, oh my God, I'll fucking say whatever I want. I said, you can't say that to the parole board. What you should be saying is, I fucking took that guy hostage for three days. Looking back now, I can't believe what I did. I'm, I, I must have fucking ruined his life mentally. He's not been out of work again. I can't believe I did it. It, it. it was awful. I think about it all the time. I think about how awful I was when I did that and what an awful effect it would have had on his life. Charlie's like, ah, oh, fuck off, and fuck off. And, uh, yeah, listen, I don't regret anything in life. It was what it was. It was what it was. Let's move on. So I'm trying so hard to educate him about how the parole board want to perceive him to try and get him out. 
I'm telling him everything's being recorded. Don't fucking say anything that you don't want to be shown on this programme. Telling him that quite clearly. Then he's going, right, I'll tell you this story about when I was in Parkhurst. This fucking guy, he nicked me mop and me mop bucket and all that, and I got this fucking tomato sauce jar, and I fucking stuck it in his head and his neck, and fucking there was claret everywhere. And I'm like, fucking sitting there, I've got the whole film crib. Here. I'm like, for fuck's sake. Right, let's move on and let's talk about something else. So then we start talking about the Iraqi hostages. Told me a story about the Iraqi hostages. Do you know them guys took 269 people hostage, three Iraqi terrorists, on a plane in the Heathrow? They took them off the plane, they caught them, put them in Belmarsh. Charlie went into the cell, barricaded the cell, kept them for three days, had one with a noose round his neck, got the other ones tickling his feet, and one was under the fucking bed shitting himself, right? And he went in and he went, right, so you want to come into England and take 200 odd fucking passengers on a plane, hostage, British people, in England, and then you come into fucking Belmarsh? You bumped into the wrong fucking person, lads, because I'm going to take you hostage now. Boots the fucking door shut, keeps them for three days. Doesn't kill them, doesn't batter them, doesn't do anything. I mean, the three Iraqis must have been absolutely fucking shitting themselves. But so would the 260-odd hostages on the fucking plane that had just landed from Afghanistan or whatever would have been shitting themselves. So anyway, the end of the siege comes. Charlie gets seven years added to his sentence. Seven months later, they were let out of prison and sent back home. Where's the fucking justice in that? And I'm not saying that he should have took a hostage, and I'm not saying what he did was right, but where is the justice in that? You know, they should have gone to prison for 20 years for that. Charlie quite rightly should have got seven years, but he shouldn't have got seven years and they were let out six months later. And all these things that have been happening with Charlie in prison have just been festering in his brain, and he's convinced and everyone most of the people in the outside world are all convinced that the system is totally against him they'll never let him out uh, and all this anyway we carried on doing the program and we're doing the program for about two years and when paula was getting married we shot loads of stuff um like at the wedding and all the rest of it we got everyone to sign all these release forms and all the rest of it as you do Paul was like, yeah, you know, I want to film everything and all this and brilliant, whatever. So, you know, it was all being, you know, all being filmed and all this stuff, whatever. And then, you know, you, there, there was no presenter. So, I mean, there was a situation like where I went to Ira's house, Charlie's mum's. And um, she lived in Aberystwyth. Ever such a nice lady. Absolutely lovely lady. So we went down. Paula took me down to meet Ira and with the film crew. She was happy for us to be there. And we went round and we got, a, you know, a few drinks. We had a laugh and all the rest of it. And we filmed loads of really nice stuff, uh, telling us all, you know, Charlie's childhood and, you know, all about meeting Tom Hardy and loads of really nice stuff. But the thing is with Ira, she's got such a fantastic sense of humour. She's dead funny. She's really, really funny and dead down to earth. One of the nicest people you can ever meet. So when all the footage was all put into a big fucking pool and then the Channel 4 guys just pick it all out, edit it together. I never see that process. That's out of my remit. I'm the one that fucking got the programme commissioned, got them to make it, and I was the one that got all the footage with Charlie and all the rest of it. And then all the wedding footage and all the old stuff that they wanted to use. So I watched the programme and it comes on, I'm talking to Ira, Again, absolutely lovely lady. She's one of the funniest ladies I've ever met. She's got a heart of gold. She's an absolute darling. So I, we're, we're talking for an hour and a half. Really lovely conversation, whatever. You know, like when you're talking to someone, you just start fucking gibbering away and you don't even know the camera's on and blah, blah, blah. And you just say like a fleeting comment. So I said to her, I said, uh, you know, I said about him being locked in a cage and da, 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 da. I said, so what would you do then if Charlie come home and she went, well, what I'd do is... Um, I'd probably lock him in a fucking cage at the bottom of the garden anyway, or whatever. She said a comment like that. And to me and Paula, it was hilarious. When it was on the programme on Channel 4, Charlie rang me up. The minute she said it, it went, fucking hell, have you heard my own fucking mum, Ira? She's a legend. She's, I've just fucking laughed my head off for 10 minutes. She's so fucking funny. And I was like... Yeah, she is really funny, because I know she's funny, Paula knows she's funny, you know she's funny, but there's fucking seven million people watching this. And that could have come across as his mum being absolutely fucking psychotic, not wanting him home, and if you ever come home, she'd lock him in a cage, which was completely the opposite of of how it how it was meant to, you know, how it was said. So so that was in the first episode. So the document so the documentary's going on. 
the first episode's going on, I'm thinking, yeah, this is quite good. You know, you know, Charlie's getting his, you know, he's saying what he's saying. Then they put the bit in about the tomato sauce, stabbing someone with that, and I'm like, fucking hell. We were sat there having so many conversations about remorse, about regret, about his victims, about what he's done, about the brutality that he'd got, about how they'd been treated by the system. We had all this fucking footage, which was absolutely amazing. We got 14 hours of it, just me and Charlie talking, and it's amazing. And then as the programme started going on, I was looking at some of the footage that they were using, I was thinking, they're not fucking telling any of the funny stories. They're not showing Charlie's true person. I know they've got to be balanced, where they've got to... Good and bad. So, good and bad and be totally impartial. Put a couple of bad bits in, but fucking hell, don't have it all bad. There was loads of really good bits in there, funny bits, me and him having a laugh with each other and blah, 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 which was really good. But then they started picking some really bad bits out, and I was like... I don't fucking like the look of this. The end of the first episode, I thought it was really good. I thought it was really well put together. You know, it mentioned Charlie's past. It mentioned his aspirations for the future and everything else. And, I th you know, even though it could have been a lot more positive, it was what it was. And like I said to Charlie at the start, I've got no control over the edit. So he rang me at the end of the first episode and he just went, he went, son? I went, Dad, I thought, oh, fucking hell, here we go. And he just turned around to me and he went, that was the fucking best program I have ever seen in my... I can't fucking believe it! And he's going on about I it rare, he's going about things that we said, laughing and joking. He was fucking absolutely buzzing his tits off. He loved it. So I was really pleased. You know... Secret filming, Charles Bronson, never been filmed in 48 years. Charlie's chance to have his word to the fucking world, tell everyone what's been going on. That was what he knew the opportunity was. And that is what we did. Second episode. Second episode comes on. So I was watching the second episode. So I'm watching the second episode and I'm thinking, you know, you know, I want to put that in. You know, I want to put that in. Why have they not put this bit in here? Why have they not put that bit in there? And da, 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 da. And, um, and at the end of the documentary, we're in the kitchen with Channel 4 talking for an hour. The camera was just sat on a tripod. So we're just talking away, fucking having a chat and all the rest of it and blah, blah, blah. Maz is in the kitchen cooking and all this. Maz gets on really well with Charlie. Talk to each other on the phone all the time about cottage pie cooking. He rings her up and fucking tells her what ingredients to put in casseroles and all sorts. They get on like an house on fire. My wife is lovely. She'd never say a bad word about anyone. She's worked at the hospital for 27 years in the A&E. She's an absolute darling. You'll never meet a more caring person. And she loved Charlie to bits. Bearing in mind, my wife even thought that Charlie was my son. That is how undercover I was. My fucking son didn't even know. Nobody knew. Absolutely nobody knew. And from Charlie's point of view, nobody knew in his family. Charlie and me, we'd agreed what we were going to do, and that was it. And it was both of us that did it, not just me, and it wasn't just Charlie. It was I think both that's of us. the main thing for people to think, because you're an undercover paparazzi, that people need to know that both of you were involved it was oh, a both scam we can make a crust and these are both laughing about it and creating things it's not just you going undercover fooling charlie old man in prison pulling a wheel over his eyes and then it's just a case of you set off to the sunset like, both he's were involved and i think that's important to touch on like why right, you do you know do you know what this is one this is one thing that pisses me off how were we not both involved in it? Fucking Charlie on the telly, on the videos, like, son, all right, son, yeah, listen, do you remember your fucking mother? I met her at the Waverly Club. She was fucking mental. And all the letters that I've got and everything since we started doing it, there's always been son, and I've always written back, like, dad. It's, it's always been that way. We were both, both completely aware of what we were doing. 100%. We had a fucking great laugh. And do you know what was really good? I fucking loved it. The fact that every time I went to see Charlie or spoke to him on the phone, he had somewhere to piss himself about, something to fucking laugh about, and something to say to the prison service. Fuck you. This fucking guy's coming here, a journalist, that you wouldn't allow in, and we fucking rigged it so that he can come in. He's filmed me. 
He's fucking done all my legal shit. He's got me a new legal team. He's taken on the fucking Ministry of Justice and won against Dominic Robb and got an open fucking parole hearing for me. Fuck you lot. We were yeah. laughing his bollocks off. How bad were his beatings in prison? Oh, his beatings were terrible. Was it antagonised by Charlie, though? Or was it just beatings out of nothing? Right. Can we go to this? Uh, we'll, we'll go back to yeah, the end yeah, of the yeah, documents yeah. that are very important. Yeah. Right. I say, Right. You know when you see, um, you see the Bronson film? Yeah. This is what really, really upsets me because me and Charlie are very, very close. I mean, we've had a massive fucking fallout now and we'll probably never even speak again. And if that's the case, that's the case. It is what it is. Um, I've had loads of conversations with Charlie and I've seen the film Bronson. Now, people watch the film Bronson and they go, it's fucking brilliant. Fucking what a film. What a fucking legend Charlie Bronson is. What a fucking legend. It's fucking brilliant. Hard as fuck. Fucking brilliant. Duh, 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 duh. Right. I've actually spoken to the man, like I'm sat here with you now, I've sat with him for fucking, for five and a half years, having visits with him, talking together, with chocolate, sandwiches, coffee, the fucking lot. I've spoken to him nearly every day on the phone for five years, give or take a couple of days, seriously, nearly every single day. And I don't think the film did him any good whatsoever. Because what happened was, Charlie loves being on the telly. He loves being in the papers. He loves the limelight. He fucking loves it. There's no arguments about that. I've told him, and he fucking agrees with it. He loves it. Anything that happens, he rings me, get me in the fucking papers, get me in the paper. Why am I not in the paper this week? Get me on the fucking telly. All just constant, right? So you've, what people don't realise is he's locked in a concrete box, right, the size of the average toilet, 23 hours a day. He's got fuck all to do. But he's rehabilitated himself. He does his artwork. People say he fucking sits there. He doesn't pay any bills. He doesn't work. He's never worked all his life. He's got a dead easy life. He's this, he's that, and the other. Right. You try sitting in a cell for 23 hours, yeah, every single day, and every day it creates a masterpiece. A piece of art, an A3 piece of art, might take him two or three days. And he sits there with all the detail and all the pens and everything, and it fucking takes him ages. And every bit of art that he does is a masterpiece. He doesn't just get a bit of paper and fucking scribble a picture on it. It's his life. He gets drawn into his art. And that is part of him being put onto a bit of paper. Now, to me, that is more than a full-time job. There's loads of people that would have that talent that would not have the determination and the drive that he's got to do his artwork. So he's not a lazy fucker that just sits in his cell doing anything. He fucking creates stuff. He could do the same as all the other prisoners do, fucking shout out the window and fucking talk shit all day and sit there fucking watching telly and all that. He doesn't. He's very constructive, and that's how he's rehabilitated himself. So going back to the brutality and the stuff... The conversation that we've had, the film makes it look like the prison guards open the door and Charlie just jumps out and knocks fuck out of all of them. We've all seen the film Bronson. That's what it comes across as. It's not like that at all. It's not like that at all. What used to happen was, he'd have a row with a screw. Something would happen. He'd fucking have a row with one of them or whatever. A couple of them would grab him. He'd fucking clock one or whatever. That'd be it. He'd go back to his fucking cell, he'd get locked up, and then about one o'clock in the morning, two o'clock in the morning, the door would fucking boot open, there'd be 12 of them with helmets on, truncheons, everything, and they would go in and they would batter the living fuck out of him. Absolutely fucking batter him. I'm talking batter him senseless. they fucking wrap him up and put him in a, in a body bag, you know, like with all straps around it, and stand him in a box. And he'd be left there for three days in a fucking box, standing upright, covered in blood and bo broken bones and all sorts, right? When he wasn't in his box, they'd pull him out of his box. He'd be in a fucking big straight jacket like this. Right? They'd go in, they'd just throw his food on the floor. They wouldn't even leave it on the fucking plate. They'd just go in and tip it on the floor. He had to eat his food off the floor like a fucking dog, lick it off the floor. Then they'd go in and kick the shit out of him again. And they keep kicking the shit out of him. And in them days, it was all ex-military people. So they were all hard bastards. Fucking stole steel toe caps and all the rest of it. They used to go in and kick the living shit out of him all the fucking time. Now, what had happened is, if I kick the shit out of you now, right, 
you'd be like, fucking alert. But if I kick the shit out of you every day for two weeks, after two weeks, you'd be like, oh, fucking hell, is that, it? Is that all you've got? Because your body would become used to it. And that's what happened with Charlie. He's, he got used to being battered that much that he just got immune to it. And then he started thinking to himself, I'm not fucking letting these get away with that. So every time that door opened, he was expecting 12 people to come and be riot shields and kick the shit out of him. So every time the door opened, he was fucking there, ready, and he'd fucking launch it, whoever it was, come out swinging and all the rest of it. But that was them that made him do that. I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that he's not been violent and he's not been a nasty bastard, he fucking has, and I'll be the first to tell you that. Some of the stories that he's told me are things that have gone on. I've said that I will never repeat, and I will never repeat them ever again. They're between me and him. There's a lot of personal stuff that we'll never talk about to anybody. Um, the fighting and the brutality and all the rest of it was absolutely shocking, and it was done to such an extent that it's actually given him fucking post-traumatic stress, right? He's, he's traumatised. He would never admit it, but I wouldn't be surprised if he didn't wake up in the middle of the night having fucking nightmares and all sorts of stuff. He slept on concrete floors with no bed, no fucking toilet seat, nothing for like two years. It's just, you know, they fed him under a cat flap under the door, a little flap with his food. He didn't see anybody, he didn't integrate with anyone. Anyway, going back to the documentary. So, when the documentary was on Channel 4, it was on prime time, 9pm on the Monday, 9pm on the Tuesday. So, the documentary said all these you know amazing things said all these fucking not so amazing things that's how they do documentaries you know you know what you know what you're in the media the same as me the media just fucking use things to their own advantage it's like you you're using me now to come on your show to get viewers yeah. i'm using you to come on your show so i can tell the story of me and Charlie, how we made up being father and son to manipulate the media and manipulate the prison service for a fucking load of fun and to make a few quid and have a right good fucking laugh. That's how the media work. People don't realise how it works. So anyway, the Channel 4 thing, it's all going on, I'm watching it, I'm watching it. I've not seen fuck all. They won't let me see the edit, they won't let me get involved in the edit. So I'm watching the programme and towards the end of it, I started thinking, all oh, right, it's coming towards the end, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's good, Charlie said that, it's good he said this. The one thing I wanted to make sure that I got in there was Phil Danielson. And I wanted Phil Danielson to go into the programme and I wanted to say, 23 years, it's enough. Even I think Charlie should be let out. And that was the golden nugget for us in the programme. That was the golden nugget, right? Nobody in this country could have ever got Phil Danielson to go on the programme and say that. Like, with that, I'm not talking about threatening him or anything, about to go on the programme of his own free will and talk about the, the crime and, and face up to what happened and explain from his side. And the fact that he went on and said that he thinks that he wouldn't have an argument with Charlie, I thought that was absolutely fantastic. Nothing like that had ever happened for Charlie for like 30 years. Nothing. So that was a fucking... I was in the front room, I was like, fucking yes, fucking brilliant, and all this. Charlie rings me in the adverts, fucking hell, I can't fucking believe he said fucking amazing. Right, so basically it comes to the end of the documentary, part four. And what's happened is I'm basically stood there in the kitchen with Maz and we're having a fucking chat, we're talking away and blah, blah, blah. And the camera's on a tripod. You can see the camera, it's not even fucking moving, it's not, you know, it's there. And you know, the like, blah, 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 they're filming for ages. You know what it's like, yeah. me and you have done loads of TV stuff. And, um, and then they go, right, okay, yeah, right, sound brilliant, fucking great, we'll leave it there. So they did that. And then the camera was still rolling. Yeah. So then basically, they've just, you know, this um, Kelly, the director, just got into this conversation. So we're just having a general chat. And, um, and she said, so what do you think, like, do you, what do you think that might, would you be worried when he comes out? And Maz said something along the lines of, well, yeah, of course I'd be worried. He's been locked up for 49 years, never met him before. Of course I'd be worried. And, and any normal person would be worried. It's, it's not a bad thing to say. Beforehand, she never said anything like that. She said, of course I'm not worried. I speak to Charlie all the time. He's a lovely guy. I'd welcome him to our house anytime. He could move in tomorrow. There wouldn't be a problem at all. Blah, 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 and all this. Talking to me. And then she goes, so what about you, George? Ann? Like, do, do, like, are you manipulating Charlie? Is Charlie manipulating you? 
are you worried about him being violent? So I just fucking turned around, dead ad hoc, not even knowing that the camera's still going, because very cleverly she's walked across the kitchen and fucking stood somewhere totally away from the camera. And the camera guys, fucking two camera guys, have walked off, right? So I've just turned around and I said, listen, I said, I don't know whether I'm fucking manipulating him, whether he's manipulating me. I don't know what the fuck's going on. I said, if they let him out tomorrow, he could come out with a fucking bread knife, kick the shit out of me and fucking stab me with a bread knife. I said, he could do that tomorrow. How the fuck do I know? I've never met him outside of prison. I said, but anybody could walk down the fucking road. I could be in the chippy tomorrow night and someone could come in and kick the shit out of me and stab me with a fucking bread knife. And I actually said to her, I said, but do you know what? Charlie wouldn't fucking do that. Do you know why? Because he's rehabilitating himself with his art. I said, the only thing he'd fucking stab me with would be a crayon. And that's what I said. I said, exactly, word for word, what I said. And then when the programme came on and they started fucking playing that bit, I thought, oh, right, they're, they're going to end with this. And then he went, she goes, will you be worried about him? Come? She said something to Maz, and, you know, Maz said something that came across completely the fucking wrong way because he'd added it completely wrong. They didn't edit the... 20 minutes before of her fucking blowing smoke up Charlie's ass and saying what an amazing bloke he was and how lovely he was. Then it comes to my bit and it just goes, she said, would you be worried if it comes out? And I said, well, well f I don't know. Yeah, fucking, he could manipulate me. He could come out, fucking kick the shit out of me, stab me with a bread knife. How do I know? And then they cut it. And it just went to the fucking credits and the credits started coming up and I was like, what the fuck? And that is how they ended it. And I'm so fucking disgusted. And I found out now, and I know the reason why they did it. I know the reason why they did it. Charlie's parole hearing was the week after. They wanted to get the programme out before the parole hearing, right? Me and you know, people in the media know, lawyers know, parole boards don't go and look at newspaper articles about prisoners. They don't look at newspaper articles. They don't watch TV programmes. They're not allowed to base any decisions about him being let out on anything to do with any media or TV or newspaper. They're not allowed by law. They cannot, that can't go into their equation. So next thing, my fucking phone starts going, beep, 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 fucking going on like this. And I'm like... People message me going, that's fucking amazing, Phil Danielson, what he said, and this fucking this and what Charlie said. And I'm thinking, oh, this is really good, fucking blah, blah, blah. Next thing, I get a fucking text message off Richard Booth, who's a friend of Charlie's. Charlie said, the documentary was absolutely brilliant, absolutely fantastic, but you fucked it up right at the end. You're a complete fucking cunt. You're a disgrace. You won't ever fucking speak to you again. Go and fuck yourself, and fucking he hopes you get arse cancer and you run out of morphine. That's exactly what he said to me. So I was like... Right, okay then. So, I'm like, what the fuck do we do now? He's got his parole next Monday. Um, so we'd already sorted out with the parole. We already sorted it out. I was his son. He was going to come and work at the crime museum. He had a job. We got him a car we're getting him a caravan to live in. We we're going to set his art studio up so he could do his artwork. Everything was all fucking sorted. For the Monday, this was four or five days later. Next thing, don't want to fucking speak to me, don't want anything to do with me and all the rest of it. What I said to Charlie was the week before the parole hearing, this father and son story, he wanted me to stand up in the court, the Royal Court of Justice, and tell everyone what a great dad he was and how much I loved him and he had this job and he had this and he had that and he had the other. And I said, whoa, hold on a minute, Charlie. Right? Me and you taking the piss with the media and taking the piss out of the Ministry of Justice and fucking having a laugh and making a few quid and just fucking enjoying ourselves and having loads of fun. That's one thing. I said, I ain't standing up in the Royal Courts of Justice and fucking saying that you're my dad. There is absolutely no chance because that is crossing the fucking line. You're talking perjury, perverting courts of justice and all sorts of shit. I ain't doing it. I said, I'll write a really nice letter to the court as your friend, blah, 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 and telling them how wonderful you are and all the rest of it, which I meant from the bottom of my heart, and I did send him a fucking amazing letter. And that was it. So I went to the parole hearing, and, um, and that was it. And then Channel 4 were really, really fucking pissed off because they wanted me to give evidence at the parole, and that's why they wanted to end the film. And because I said to them right at the last minute, I'm not fucking giving evidence at the parole. And that's how it's ended. We had a bit of a fucking... And that's how the end of the documentary made me look like a complete twat. Is and in turn, Charlie thinks that he made him look like a twat. The thing is with Charlie, I can completely understand where he's coming from. A hundred percent. But what he doesn't understand is you've got all these fucking idiots all around the country. You've got 
82 percent of them messaging me saying that was absolutely fucking brilliant charles bronson has been on the telly giving his own voice and all this has come out and all the publicity you've got dave courtney right he did a thing he did a little um video he did a video on um on his facebook or whatever and obviously charlie had wrote to him or whatever or spoke to him on the phone and dave courtney went on and he said look you know, this fucking documentary Bambi's done, you know, I think he said a few spiteful things on there. You know, he said a few things that he shouldn't have said and, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know, I think it, it was all, I think it was all geared around Bambi himself and blah, 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 and this, that and the other. And he said all these things on this um, Facebook thing. So I watched it and I thought to myself, do you know what? Every single fucking word he said on that thing is completely true. It's completely... I completely accept everything that Dave Courtney said on that video, completely and utterly, because what he was saying was from Charlie's point of view and his own point of view. And I accept that. And do you know what? I've got a lot of respect for that man. I didn't, I didn't know him before, and I've got a lot of respect for him after seeing that. So the next day, Charlie's got a friend of his, Richard Booth. I've had some really good dealings with Richard Booth. He's an absolutely lovely guy, and he's got Charlie's interest best interest at heart and i completely appreciate that charlie rings him up fucking tell george i couldn't it's fucking this and fucking whatever so richard booze fucking messaging me telling me what charlie said because they've cut my phone off because i've been filming him in prison so he can't ring me now they've cut the visits off to fucking george bambi the reporter fuck off you're not doing it anymore you bastard how have you got in and fucking done that they've completely cut me off i'm no good to charlie now because he can't ring me he can't fucking phone me i can't visit him blah 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 anyway his message Richard said to fucking tell him he's a twat, tell him he's fucking this, and blah, blah, blah. Richard got caught in the middle. You know, I, I messaged Richard back, fuck off, fucking whatever, and all this, which maybe I shouldn't, because he's a lovely, lovely guy, and he's genuinely got Charlie's interest at heart, and I completely appreciate that. So he went to the papers, and uh, Charlie said, right, fucking Richard, go to the papers, tell him I don't want him on my fucking parole hearing. He's not fucking coming to the parole hearing, the High Courts of Justice, fucking blah, blah, blah. Anyway, the next day, Dave Courtney rang me, and um, I've had a few conversations with Dave Courtney. Don't know him that well. But when you see him on the telly or you see people, so, you know, you think to yourself, fucking hell, he's a bit fucking, you know, not the sort of bloke you'd go down the pub and have a beer with or whatever. You'd be a bit fucking intimidated by him. But from speaking to him on the phone, he's actually such a genuinely nice, fucking really good guy. Re and I'm not just saying that, he really is. He rang me up. Hi, George. Because I'd rang him. I said, look, Dave, I want to go to the uh, Royal Courts of Justice. I said, but after this programme, there's going to be fucking hundreds of knobheads outside. I've been having all these messages saying people are going to fucking kill me, shoot me, stab me, fucking do whatever. If I turn up at the court, I'm a fucking dead man and all this. I said, will you come down to the court with me? And, um, and you know, just come in with me. And Dave said, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you get me on the approved list or whatever, I'll come in with you. I said, right. So I sent, I don't know whether he spoke to Charlie by this time or not. So I sent Dave the form over. He's filled it in. I spoke to the parole board and said, look, I want to bring someone with me, blah, blah, blah. Go to the hearing and all this. So that was it. So they said, yeah, we've already organised you two spaces because he went months ago. We've already saved two for you. I said, right. So anyway, Dave rang me the next day. And, uh, and he said, Dave, he said, uh, he said, George, he said, listen, it's Dave. I'm just giving you a ring. I've had Charlie on the phone. And like you said, he's fucking fuming. He's really pissed off, fucking blah, 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 and all this. And um, he do not want you going to the parole hearing and all this fucking blah, 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 or whatever. So I said to Dave, I said, right. I said, okay, listen. I said, that's fair enough. I said, fine. I appreciate you ringing me up, um, blah, blah, blah. And um, yeah, I, I said, I appreciate you ringing me, you know, fair play blah 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 and then we got talking and i just turned around to dave i said listen dave i said let me tell you something i said you're not fucking stupid i said i heard what you said on that thing that you did yesterday and i said fair play to you you didn't say anything that wasn't justified right i said but you do know i'm not fucking charlie's son don't you and he went um uh, i said yeah i said well i haven't told anybody I said, believe it or not, you're actually the first person that I've told. In fact, no, he's the second person i told. I said, I'm not Charlie's son. I said, me and Charlie have been fucking at it for five, six years, taking the piss out of the prison service, doing all these fucking stories and making a few quid and having a fucking laugh. And we've been splitting all the fucking money down the middle. You know, I get my off, he gets his off, fucking whatever. That's nothing to do with me, blah, blah, blah. 
I said, uh, I said, but he's not my dad. I said, I've been working with Charlie for years to try and get him out of fucking prison. I've worked my fucking ass off. And do you know what he turned around to me and said? He said, do you know what, George? He said, I really appreciate you telling me that. And he actually said to me, it won't go any further. And fair play, he's not said a single word to anybody. But he was really, really understanding on the phone. And I thought, it didn't need to be like that. He could have just rang me up and go, right, fucking turn up at that court tomorrow, you twat, and you're getting fucking kneecapped. He could have said whatever he wanted. But he didn't. He was dead fucking genuine. He was looking after Charlie's interests. And he was really nice and respectful to me. So it was all, it was all cool. So anyway, me being fucking me, I'm sat in the hotel. And um, I know I'm sat at home. This was, I think it was on the Saturday. And then Eamon Holmes rang me and um, a few other people. They're like, George, can you come in? Come on the fucking show and all this. It's like Charlie fucking at this stage hated me, never wanted anything to fucking do with me ever again. Blah, blah, blah. So I thought to myself, do you know what? All these fucking messages saying I get, I hope to get, I, I get arse cancer and fucking there's no morphine and all this and he's going to fucking ruin my life and fuck this and fuck that and whatever. I thought, oh, fuck off. We've had this conversation fucking ten times in the past where you fall out with me every fucking two months and then we're best mates again. But I thought to myself... It's not the time for all this fucking about. It's parole is on Monday. This was on the Saturday and I was fuming. So I fucking called all my contacts in. So I ended up going on the fucking Good Morning Britain, Good Morning Britain, whatever it was, the fucking Eamon Home show, Vanessa Feltz, so and all these shows. And I fucking turned up and I was going to go on GMB News, GB News with Eamon Holmes. And I was going to say, it's not my fucking dad. He's a complete and utter twat. I can't fucking stand him. He fucking takes the piss. He treats me like a fucking twat. And he can fuck off. That's what I wanted to say. But then I thought to myself, no, you can't do that. He's a fucking top guy. He's been a really good fucking friend. He's had a massive impact on my life. And I know that I've had a massive impact on his, his life because I've worked with him over the few, last six years or so. And his fucking behaviour and his thought process and everything has completely changed. I've worked with him. He said to me on the phone so many times, nobody has done in six years, what you've done for me in six years, nobody on this planet has ever done for me in my whole life. And he always says that. <clears throat> and I know he's sat in his cell and he might think I'm a fucking twat and he don't want to talk to me and blah, 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 whatever. But I know that me and him have a fucking very special relationship, a very close relationship, a relationship that he will never forget and I will never forget. And hopefully I have been of a lot of benefit to his life and I'll take all the positives that I've learned out of his life. So anyway... I'm sat there, so I thought, fuck it. I'm sat there, GMB News, I've got fucking Christopher Biggins sat next to me in the green room here and fucking someone else sat there. And um, I'm due to go on. So I thought, right. So I've got on. And uh, Amy's like, hi, George, yeah, fucking nice to see you again. Right? And you know, it's like, right, we're going live, fucking three, two, one, bump, the fucking camera straight on. I'm like, yes, um, you know, Charlie's been really good. He's never hurt anybody. He's never hurt a woman or a child. He should be let out. It's fucking what they've done to me the prison service is absolutely terrible. It's, you know, it's awful. You know, saying all these really lovely things about him, fucking amazing things about him. So I've come off there, cars picked me up. So I've gone off to this other show, done this other one. I fucking did 17 shows that day, radio, TV, everywhere. I got picked up at half six in the morning to do Eamon and I finished doing the fucking BBC News at 10 o'clock at night or somewhere and I was fucked when I got back to the hotel. I turned my phone on, I got fucking loads more interviews than they wanted doing. The next morning, Tuesday, I got up, fucking did a load of interviews and I was sat there. I can't remember what I was doing. I think I was doing like the fucking Vanessa Felt show or something like that. It was some breakfast um, news. I can't remember it was. I did that many. So I sat there and I thought, his parole hearing starts at 10 o'clock. And I thought to myself, I was just sat there at this fucking interview. It was 9 o'clock and I thought, I called the producer over. I said, I'm not going on. And he went, why, why, why? What's up? And I went, I'm going to Charlie's parole. And he went, what? And I went, I'm going to Charlie's parole. Well, I'm really sorry. I'll come back and do it for you at lunchtime or whatever. So he went, right, fine. So they got me a car. So they got me a car, took me down to the Royal Courts of Justice. And I said, don't fucking drop me off outside. Drop me off 100 yards down the road. Because I want to walk past all these fucking dickheads. And if any of them are going to fucking stab me or shoot me or punch me in the fucking mouth, they can fucking do it because I'm not scared of anybody. But what I will not do is spend six years of my life trying my best to fucking get Charlie out of prison. 
yeah, get this brand new legal team for him that we've been working tirelessly for three years and get him an open parole hearing at the Royal Courts of Justice and for me not to turn up. So I thought, do you know what? I don't give a fuck what Charlie says. I'm not being disrespectful to him, but I'm going and there's no one going to fucking stop me. So I pulled up, got out the fucking car, walked down the fucking road, walked straight into the Royal Courts of Justice, went and sat at the, sat at the back of the court. I've walked in, there's a couple of fucking heavies in there with fucking tattoos, like, fuck, what the fuck do you do? <laughs> fucking hell. And you can hear him, did he not fucking read the paper? Fucking Charlie told him not to come. I have just sat there and I thought to myself, what the fuck are you doing? How do you know Charlie? What, have you wrote him a couple of fucking letters or someone applied for a seat to come and see him? How the fuck do you know him? Do you know what I mean? You don't know what the fuck you're talking about. So I thought, I ain't having anybody telling me I'm not coming here. So I went in and I walked straight in the fucking bed and just sat there like that. Then I waited for it to all start and I could fucking see loads of people looking at me and I thought, fucking interested. They don't know the fucking story with me and Charlie. Don't know how much work I've fucking done to get him here. Everyone in this room is here because of fucking me. I was the one that got this public parole for him. So then the parole started and um, started talking and then they said, uh, they said something about the parole board. They said, oh yeah, just so everyone knows, um, there was a TV documentary that, which was made last Monday and Tuesday, primetime, Channel 4, 9pm. Just to let everybody know, none of the parole board have seen that documentary whatsoever. We have not seen it, and by law we're not allowed to look at it, and we will not be judging anything to do with this hearing on that programme. So Charlie turned around, first thing he said was, yeah, I fucking believe that when I see it, or whatever. And then... I'm sat there thinking, oh, fucking hell, calm down, Charlie. Just fucking, just be nice for a few hours and fucking chill out. And then Dean wanted to get up for a piss. Fucking hell, can't you just fucking... And I thought, do you know what? It's, I, I can't sit here and watch her. So I felt, I just wanted to jump in the telly and fucking sit next to him and give him a fucking hug and say, listen, just fucking calm down and relax. Take it nice and easy and take some deep breaths. And then I thought to myself, all these parole hearings that he's had in the past, he's walked in the room, he's had three fucking idiots talking shit for two and a half hours, and then they tell him to fuck off back to his room when he's not getting out. So in my head, I'm watching Charlie, and Charlie's sitting there automatically thinking, oh, these fuckers aren't going to let me out anyway. Like, fucking whatever. And then, but the thing was, so in the end I thought, do you know what? I don't want to fucking start being part of the media circus with the parole and fucking being in the room with all fucking Sky News and all that shit there. So I fucking slipped out before any of the reporters and everything saw me. Martin Brunt saw me from Sky News and gave me a wave. As soon as he waved, I was like, five minutes later, I'd fucking gone. So I didn't want to be start answering fucking questions about the shit with the documentary and all that bollocks. So I fucked off. So I've gone and I've got home and I've uh, got back to the hotel and I've started doing all, all these other interviews, really positive interviews and all the rest of it. And then I've started reading the stuff online from the thing saying about he's spilt his orange and he says, don't worry, Gov, I've not fucking pissed myself. And he's like, well, fucking betting, who doesn't like a bet? Who doesn't like this? And I thought, oh, fuck, you know. But anyway, to finish off, one of the reasons I wanted to come on here, right, and I really appreciate you giving me a platform to come and say this, um, the father and son thing, this started off as a job. Because I got so friendly with Charlie and we had such a good fucking laugh, it turned into a fucking brilliant friendship and we've had a fucking scream. We've had a real laugh. But I saw a newspaper article the other day and it was Charlie's brother, Mark. And basically it said on there that Mark wouldn't back Charlie's release while Charlie was still going on with the fake son story. Now, in the past... Mark's family, you know, Charlie's family, they've offered me 5,000 quid to take a DNA test. And I've always just said, just not had any communication with them, not spoke to them, not had anything to do with them. I've told Charlie, Charlie said, don't fucking speak to any of them. Leave that to me. I'll fucking deal with that. It's nothing to do with you. Don't speak to Ira. Don't speak to Mark. Don't speak to my son, Michael. Don't speak to, don't speak to anyone. I'll fucking sort it. So I'm like, right. Then I saw that thing and I thought, do you know what? This thing that we've done, my wife and my son won't really be bothered because I've never had a dad. So it's not like they missed the fucking granddad or whatever. So I can deal with all that. And I do some pretty fucking mental things with work anyway. Spend my whole life on the paparazzi TV show that I had, fucking making stories up. It's what I do for a living. The, you know, the media fucking make stories up. I make stories up. Celebrities make stories up. Everyone fucking makes stories up. But none of them was as good as me and Charlie. We had a fucking brilliant laugh doing it. But then I started thinking to myself... There needs to be an end 
There's always this when you're doing an undercover job, there's got to be a start, there's got to be a middle, there's got to be an end. There was never an end to this. Just kept going on and on and on. Next thing, I'm in the fucking, I'm at Downing Street handing a fucking petition over with 30,000 signatures. I'm fucking shouting on a loud hailer outside the Ministry of Justice thinking, what the fuck am I doing? This is not what I do. I'm a PR agent. So I said to myself the other day, this has got to come to an end. I need to get on with my life because for the last fucking five years, every time I walk into a pub or I walk down the road, everyone goes, how's your dad? When's your dad getting out? And I'm like, and then after a bit, I started fucking thinking to me, everyone saying it every fucking day. I start, start slotting in your brain that it is your fucking dad. It's not me dad. Do you know what I mean? And then you read all this shit online. Fucking George Bambi's a fraud. He's made loads of money out of Charlie. He's just using him to make money. And I fucking had plenty of money before I met Charlie. And I fucking plenty of money after I met Charlie. I've got 40 odd full-time staff. I've got 12 different businesses. I've always been successful. I was the number one paparazzi in the country, nearly 400 fucking front pages. I've made enough money by the time I was 40 to retire for the rest of my life. Didn't need to fucking work. I got involved with Charlie because it was an exciting project. But it needs to come to an end and... It needed somebody to turn around and say, right, Charlie, we've had a fucking great run together. We've had a really good laugh. He doesn't want to talk to me. He thinks I'm a fucking twat. Wants me to have arse cancer. It's going to ruin me fucking out, like, do fucking this, that, and the other, whatever. I'm not fucking interested. If he wants to contact me in a few months or write me a letter or whatever, I might reply. I might not. I won't be getting in contact with him. I'll be getting on with my life. George Bambi, the fucking PR marketing man. But I wish him all the best in the world. I hope he fucking gets out. We're recording this a week before, and I've actually said to you, or I've asked you, not to actually publish this podcast until the result of the parole hearing comes out. Because the last thing I want is this parole thing to go tits up and he doesn't get out. And then we've released this and everyone starts fucking messaging me going, well, if you hadn't done that fucking podcast and said it wasn't your dad, he'd have fucking... That's the shit that you have to yeah, put up no, with. Yeah, we'll release it after. So, I mean, releasing it yeah, after would be really good. How but, do you think Charlie will be with you coming out now? Um, I don't know. I mean, you know, we, we, we've had this bond as a father and son for so many years and we've had such a close relationship... I think it's been, I think it'd be difficult for him because he'll fucking miss talking to me. He'll miss the things that we did. And I'll tell you something. The one thing that he will miss is the publicity because he fucking loves the publicity. And I'm the best in the country at it. And now that I've gone, he won't be in the papers all the time. After his parole result comes out and this comes out, that'll be it. There'll be no more fucking big stories. It'll all be little fucking farty stories in the Huddersfield Examiner or whatever that his little crony's doing, saying, oh, he's done a bit of artwork for a charity. That's all it'll be. You feel better now? We've got it off your chest. I think that's the least I've ever spoken on a podcast. Is it? Yeah. Fucking I think you've just, you've bottled all that up for seven years, but like you say, it was a Do you know what? I'm, I'm actually fucking, I'm actually upset. I'm actually, I have been fucking drained for the last six years. I've like every bit of energy's fucking drained out of me. It's just been fucking nuts. Even dealing with the whole Paula thing. Because I love Paula to bits. She wanted to be a big fucking superstar. She thought she was going to marry Charles Bronson and be like... Then she fucking rang me up after the wedding and went, Right, Bambi, get me on. I'm a celebrity. Get me out of here. I spoke to Charlie. He said I can go on it. I'm like, Paula, it doesn't fucking work like that. You're not a celebrity. I fucking just married Charles Bronson. Of course I'm a celebrity. I'm like, fucking hell. My head was all over the fucking place. I'm dealing with like people that are just delusional. Paula was lovely, and I loved her to bits. I got on fucking great with her. We had some brilliant laughs. When she died, her mum, Hazel, and her dad, the loveliest people you'll ever met. When she died, they didn't even have enough money for the funeral. You've got all these people online, all the so-called fucking friends, having a whip round together for her to pay for the funeral. They raised fucking peanuts. Nobody put anything into it. Paula said to me, when she died, she wanted a horse-drawn carriage with four, ho four white horses and pink ribbons or whatever. And I went to Hazel, Paula's mum, and I gave her a thousand quid and paid for the horse-drawn carriage, right? They raised all the money to do the whatever, and that was it. I didn't even go to the funeral, and I was heartbroken because I wanted to go. I drove to the funeral down to Stoke, and I parked about 300 yards down the road with my binoculars, and I just wanted to see her taken in. 
Mm-hmm. And I was fucking heartbroken because she was my friend. Loved her to bits. But she had mental health issues. She used to ring me every day saying, George, I'm going to fucking die tomorrow. I'm, I, I'm not going to be here anymore. I'm going to fucking kill myself. I'm going to do this. I'm gonna... It was heartbreaking. And not only heartbreaking, it was just fucking worrying because Paula was a very, very vulnerable person. She was very vulnerable. And that's what the fucking media does to people. You know she wanted the, to be... Fa- yeah, you know how the media I know works. the media inside why did you, out. Why did you stick with it so long then? Do you know what? It just fucking overtook my life. And like I became so pally with Charlie. It, it, turned, it turned from being a job to fucking being my mate. Do you think he'll ever get out though? I hope he does. I really... Do you know what? Genuinely, I've got a genuine fucking... I've got a genuine place in my heart for Charlie and I will always fucking have it. And all these dickheads online that say fucking this, that and the other and I'm a fraud and I'm fucking ripped Charlie off and all, they ain't got a fucking clue what they're talking about. That's why on all these videos and shit, Charlie's always said, you're my son, tell them to mind their own fucking business. It's not their business, it's nothing to do with them. Basically what he's saying is, me and fucking George are doing something, don't get involved and fuck off and leave us to it. We're having a fucking, we're having it off and we're having a bit of fucking fun, now fuck off. And then all these knobheads thinking they're all being fucking very clever he's a fraud it's not his son they didn't do the fucking mustache test he didn't do fucking hell on my bio on my facebook page and twitter it says george bambi paparazzi invested to give journalist fucking blah 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 it doesn't take a genius to work out from day one i wasn't his fucking son it was obvious every fucker knew everyone but do you know what also was a real head fuck about it all all my fucking close friends, all my close friends and people that I know, even staff from the kids' home from years ago that I used to be in and all the rest of it, messaging me. Oh, I'm so fucking glad you met your dad. I'm glad you found your dad. He's fucking amazing. Ignore all the haters. Ignore all the people saying this and blah, blah, blah. And I'm thinking to myself, well, I shouldn't really ignore all them people because all them people are actually fucking right. I'm not his son, but I'm not a fucking fraudster or a con man or whatever they're fucking going to say, all the shit they come out with. But it was so hard to all them genuine people that were so lovely and so nice to me and so fucking supportive. And when did your dad getting out and going on things when people fucking slagged me off saying, George Bambi's a lovely person, he's fucking great. He's, you know, that's his son. Fucking you get on with your life. It's just all over the fucking place. And I said to me, Mrs. One there, I said, this has got to fucking stop now. Charlie wanted to be exposed on the telly on video. He wanted to, the fucking world to see him. He wanted to get his word out there. We did the documentary. The documentary was massive. Biggest viewing figures Channel 4 had for years it was really successful there was bits in it that were bad there were bits in it that were fucking brilliant charlie only looks at the bad bits but i don't i don't mind i don't mind i'm sorry that it ended like that and it shouldn't have ended like that it was fucking awful and channel four should be fucking ashamed of themselves but it did there's nothing i can do about it Mm -hmm. can't turn the clocks back i do love him to bits and i wish him all the best for the future and i really really do hope that he gets out do i think he'll be dangerous when he comes out I've spent more time with him than anybody else. Do I think it'd be dangerous? I don't think it'd be dangerous. I think he just wants to come out and fucking sit in a little shed somewhere and do his artwork and not fucking have any mind off anybody. Yeah. How do you feel when this goes out? How do you think the reaction will be? Well, I don't give a fuck how the reaction is. At the end of the day, me and Charlie have fucking done this and we've done what we've done and, you know, we've fucking... There had to come a point where someone had to say, right, enough's enough now. You know, my wife thinks her father-in-law's Charles Bronson. My fucking son thinks Charles Bronson's his granddad. You know, Charlie's brother, Mark. Oh, yeah, going back to Charlie's brother, Mark, saying about the fake son bit. This is another thing. The paper, I, I know all the fucking, I know the media, I know what they did. I know what'll have happened. The papers would have rang him up and said, what do you think about Charlie's chances of getting parole? And Neil said to him, I don't want to talk to you. No comment. I'm not interested. And then I just kept pushing him and pushing him. And he said, I'm not interested. And Illa said, maybe said something like, but while he's got that fucking fake son on board, I'm not interested. Next thing, the headline in the mirror, um, Bronson's brother refuses to back parole over fake son, which is really fucking unfair to Mark. It's really unfair to his mum, Ira, and all the rest of it. But as I said, when this whole process started, Charlie made his decision, I made my decision, I stuck by it with my family, he was going to stick by it with his family. I've never spoke to Ira or Mark or anyone else, but now I've got the opportunity here, and you look back, they fucking know I wasn't his son. They're not stupid. 
but you know what can I do on behalf of like myself? All I can do is apologise. But it is what it is. Yeah. I mean, because Charlie has loved that people do adore him. Like they they fuck him. Well, I'll tell you what's something. The, what's, the, what's the funniest memory you've got of Charlie? They've got every reason to adore him. He's fucking hilarious. What's the funniest memory you've got of him? Um, oh, I used to fucking wind him up all the time. We used to just fucking piss ourselves. He'd ring me up and go, right, fucking hell, right, get the fucking TV channel out so I get the sky and fucking watch. Right, what's on at nine o'clock? BBC One. I'd be like, right, um, fucking mastermind. BBC Two, eight o'clock, such and such. Right, Channel Four, nine o'clock. I'm like, oh, there's a fucking film on tonight. And he'd, and he'd be like, uh, oh, yeah, what is it? And I'm like, fucking hell, you're not going to believe it. And he'd be like, what, what? And I go, fucking Bronson's on at nine o'clock, the film with Tom Hardy. And he'd go, you're fucking joking. And then I'd go, yeah, I am joking, you fucking idiot. It's fucking news at 10 or something. And he'd go, oh, you twat. And then we'd just fucking wind each other up all the time. But I mean, we used to do fucking such mad shit. He'd fucking phone up and he'd like he'd pretend he's Bob Mortley. Like the cannibal from the fucking... Is that George? I'm going to fucking eat you. It's fucking Bob. And he'd just go into one for 10 minutes. And then another, other times he'd ring up, he'd be fucking singing Elvis songs. He'd be fucking doing all... And we, we just had such a fucking laugh. We just got on. So we used to sit there at the visits and we'd piss ourselves that much. All the fucking screws that'd be sat around us, they'd be laughing the bollocks off. And when we come out, the screws used to say to me, they're fucking fighting over your visits. Who does your visits? Because it's such a fucking good laugh. You going to miss them? Missed what you've been involved in. No, it's that not I'm not gonna I'm not gonna miss what I'm, I'm not gonna miss what I've been involved in because I've, I've been involved in this business for fucking 30 odd years. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm I'm retired. You know, if something else comes up with someone or whatever, then I'll I'll never say fucking never, because you know, you get bored, you want to do stuff. But this is a bit more than that. Will I miss him? I will miss him. I will fucking miss him a lot. Hopefully he's can resolve it though. It's a shame if it's ended that way and it never gets resolved. Because me and if you've done everything you've set out to do and help him and make him a bit on the side and try and help him with his parole. Oh, and you're clearly good. My you're off. clearly a good thing for him. People's going to have their assumptions. Listen, your papa. I and mean, you're looking at both sides. If everything you say is legit, both these were using each other. Of course we were. The thing is, I've fallen out. We, you know, we've fallen out so many times. There was a situation, where, oh, you want to tell him about the rainbow caravan? You know, doing a picture with a caravan. I said, do me a nice picture of a caravan with some flowers and all that shit. I said this before. He said, right. So anyway, he sent me the picture. So I sent the picture to the paper and I said, look, Charles Bronson has done this picture of a caravan, right? It's got flowers in it. It's got the sea. It's got water. It's got fucking trees. It's got lovely shrubs everywhere. When has he ever any, done any artwork like this before? His mentality is changing. I'm getting through to him. So they went, oh, that's fucking brilliant. We'll run that in the paper. So do you know what they did? They fucking put the caravan in the paper. And then, you know, when they do them caricatures, hmm. they did a fucking caricature of him leaning up against the caravan, right? <laughs> His fucking head was about four times the size of a normal head. Legs crossed. He had a fucking fag in his mouth. He rang me up. Fucking hell. You'd have thought I'd have fucking murdered him. You fucking swat! What the fucking... I fucking don't smoke! My fucking head's four times the fuck... Don't fucking ring me again! I'm gonna fucking kill you, you twat! And then fucking puts the phone down. Don't hear from him for a month. And then he rings me back and he goes... All right, son. And I'm like, all right, Dad. And he goes, right, well, listen. You know, like families, they always fall out now and again. I went, yeah. He goes, right. He said, well, let, let's put that big fat head and the cigarette behind us then. <laughs> so I'm like, right, all right. And then we're just fucking back to square one again. How strong is he? How strong is Charlie Bronson? Well, uh, he, he's fucking strong as an ox. Absolutely fucking strong as an ox. Do you know what? He's such a stubborn bastard. And I fucking told him this. I'm not saying anything to you or anything to your viewers that I haven't said to his face. He's a stubborn bastard. He always has been. You have to explain to him about things because he doesn't understand certain things. And when you sit down and explain to him, and then he goes, oh, fucking hell, I can see why now. It's like the thing with the parole, me going in front of the parole board saying to his son, I'm not going to stand in front of the Royal Courts of Justice saying to his son, why would the fuck would I do that? I said to him, me and you, our, um, our relationship on the Channel 4 programme they will see that if they see it, and they'll see what our relationship's like. Because once you're 
parole hearings finished on Friday. They've got two weeks to give you a decision. They're going to fucking watch a documentary. Are you telling me that them three part parole people aren't going to watch a documentary? They're going to go home fucking that night and watch it. They're not going to say they've watched it, but they're going to watch it. But I'll tell you what, fair play to him. Yeah. He always sticks by his guns. He got up there. He didn't have any airs and graces. He swore. He just, it was his normal self. He fucking said it as it was. And that was it. And Charlie will never change. There's other things. There's other things. I think to myself, I mean, I've had so much contact with him, more contact with fucking anyone over the years. Sometimes I think to myself, does he actually want to get out? I genuinely think, does he actually want to get out? And then when I think about it, It'd be fucking scary after 49 years coming out into this shithole. And I fucking told him loads of times, you're fucking better off where you are. <laughs> yeah. And the other thing is, it's like, if he did come out, would he be able to adjust to the life, to the situation, to fucking mobile phones and iPads and this, that and the other and fucking Facebook and shit? And Can you imagine him having a Facebook yeah. account? Enough. Where do you go forward for the future, Georgia boy? Well, I retired fucking years ago. So, I mean... I just do my, uh, you know, I, I do my PR stuff. Um, I'm actually, after we leave here, I'm on my way to Holland. I'm on my way to Holland in about three hours. Uh, and I'm going over there for three weeks um, with a really big writer from Netflix. And I'm writing a six-part series. And um, six-part series is going to be all about from the very first day I met Charlie up to the present day. Um, but it's not going to have any of the fucking shite in that's a load of bollocks about him fucking threatening to stab me and stuff. It's going to have all nice things in there and all the humour and the relationship and my relationship with Paula, Paula's relationship with Charlie, you know, our relationship together as the, with, with the media. Because like I said in the programme, I manipulate the media, Paula manipulates the media, Charlie manipulates the media, and the fucking media manipulate the media. media. I mean, what a team we were. We had a fucking cracking run at it. Paula paid the fucking mortgage off. Do you know what I mean? Charlie, if he ever does come out, he won't need a caravan. Don't worry about that. He'll be out by himself, a nice little fucking cottage. Oh, yeah, going back to that, there was a caravan. We had a thing set up, um, a GoFundMe page to get him a caravan. So I set that up for the parole board to say when he comes out, he's going to live in a caravan in Devon. Obviously, he can't show that he's earning any money or he's got any money or whatever. So we're trying to show that when he comes out, he's got a caravan somewhere to live. So we did the GoFundMe page. We started it off. I put two grand in it just to get it started. And uh, all these so-called fucking supporters or whatever, all these like people that are like, fucking Charlie's amazing. They fucking love him to bits. None of them put their hands in the fucking pockets. We raised about 3,200 quid. And that was it. So when all this went tits up with the documentary and he fucking saw his arse, I immediately closed the Just Giving page down and I refunded everybody the money. And I said to him, right, you're not fucking coming to Devon. You're not going to the fucking caravan. The Just Fund Me page is closed. Fucking that's it. And everyone that put money in has had it back. And do you know what really fucking brought a tear to me eye? There were people that went on there that donated a pound. And they were putting messages like, this is my last pound, Charlie, but I'm sending it to you. It fucking brought a tear to your eye. Because there were so many genuine people that care about him. Do you know what I mean? But there's also so many fucking dickheads out there that think that they fucking... They think they own him. Yeah. This, what happens is this, the people out there... I'll give, I'll give you an, a quick example, right? So I'll probably wrap it up. Right. I get so many people messaging me. Right, I want to write your dad a fucking letter. He's not written back to me. They message me. He's not, he's, not, he's not wrote back to me, blah, blah, blah. Has anyone ever noticed that sometimes when you get a letter off Charlie, it's got a stamp on it and it'll have an address on it and the address will all be scratched out and rubbed out and he'll write another address on it. That's where someone will have sent him a stamped addressed envelope so that they can reply to him. So if I'm Charles Bronson and you send me a letter saying, can I have a piece of artwork, please? And you put an envelope with a stamp on it with your address on it for me to put a bit of my artwork in and put it in the envelope and send it back to you. If you think that that's how Charlie works, it fucking doesn't. He doesn't sit there doing artwork for Muppets all fucking day that he's never spoke to before. But if somebody wrote to him and said, Charlie, there's a book of 12 stamps. There's a stamped addressed envelope for me. 
right? I hope you're doing well, blah, 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 and sent him a really nice letter to ask him how he is and send him a couple of photographs. Then he will reply to them with that stamps addressed envelope because what people don't realise is they go, he fucking doesn't reply. I've wrote to him like 10 times and he doesn't reply. I've asked him for artwork loads of times. Of course he's not going to fucking reply. It costs him a quid for a stamp. He only gets 50 quid a week. Send him 12 stamps in and send him some photographs and send him a nice little fucking letter and you might get a reply off him. Georgia boy, would you like to finish up on anything? Um, no, I just, I, I wish Charlie all the best in the world. I really fucking do from the bottom of my heart. It's been an amazing journey. We've both had such good fucking fun. We've had such a good laugh. We've worked really hard on the parole. Um, I don't think he'll get released. I, I, I really don't. I, 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 I mean, I'm just being realistic. I've been working with the legal team for years. Um, I do think that he should be decategorized or he should be progressed through the system. I mean, I'd fucking love it if he got released. It'd be amazing. But, you know, I said to him a month ago something that no one has ever said to him. I said to him, listen, you're not getting released. The best you can possibly hope for is getting decatted or moved to an open prison. Because what I didn't want him to do was get his hopes up, then they tell him he's not coming in, and then he fucking kicks off and thinks the system's against him again and gets another fucking eight years for taking another governor hostage. Yeah. I do, I do think he should get out, I do. Yeah, same. George, listen, for coming on today and telling me you're exclusive, I appreciate it. I wish you all the best for the future and hopefully you and Charlie can patch things up, you can move on and have a laugh. Yeah. Well, that's what it's all about. And if anyone didn't see at the start of the programme, Charles Bronson is not my dad, he's my fucking mate.